All right, welcome back to the Theological Conference, 30th anniversary, 30 years. Wow, how time flies. All right, so we will continue today with the afternoon session, day two. As you can see there, there's the schedule for today. This morning we had a couple of great lessons presentation so if you can go to our youtube channel you'll be able to see the recordings or should be able to we also had a great faith story from Rene in equatorial guinea and now we will introduce uh joe martin and he will talk about simply jesus if you go to presenters on the same website you will see a short bio as of january 2017, Joe is retired as president and executive director of COGGC, Church of God General Conference. He's still teaching through Zoom, distance learning at Atlanta Bible College. Joe and Rebecca moved to Arizona to be near their family. Joe received his doctorate from Columbia Theological Seminary, and one of his masters is from Fuller Theological Seminary. He recently published through Amazon a short book called Simply God, Yahweh, or the four letters there, 6,828. You might know what that is about. Uh, Joe still teaches, preaches at different times. He and Rebecca have been to Africa to serve the churches there for about 25 years now. Wow. Mission work is a great part of their lives. So... Joe will present today on simply Jesus, biblifying and depaganizing Yahweh's Messiah. So I'd like to introduce Joe Martin now. Good, good morning there. You're in Arizona. Hey, good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Yeah, it's morning here, believe it or not. It is morning. <laughs> All right. And... Um, Here's your PowerPoint, and whenever you're ready, take it away. Thank you. Thank you, Carlos. Good morning or afternoon or evening, everybody. I heard several folks in other continents may listen in, so it's a blessing to be with you. Let me have a little prayer. Father God, thank you for this day, and I ask your blessing on us. Just help overcome my nervousness. But Father, help me to recall the things that you've studied. I just pray that you would Draw us close and keep us in your hands and bless this time in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay. Um, thank you, Carlos. Uh, just for your information, I'm in the laundry room. I've tried to make it look real nice. It's actually, I'm in Sun City, Arizona. It's a retirement home. <laughs> but um, Rebecca has her office on the other end, and I have this office and there's uh rebecca and me right there here's my shema <laughs> and there's my burlap jesus that i that i like to emphasize so i'm in the the room on the south end which used to be a golf cart room believe it or not and then someone put a wall up there before we bought it and so this is my library study and this is where i do my zoom classes for uh, atlanta bible college as well Okay, uh, let's look at this. So my title is simply Jesus, uh, Biblifying and Depaganizing Yahweh's Messiah. I modified a few things in it. So, and uh, what I'm trying to do is based off of John 20, 31, these are written that you might believe that Jesus is the Messiah. So using the Hebrew, Yeshua HaMashiach, Jesus the Christ, the English, and even noting that Isa al Masi, Jesus the Messiah, is in the Quran also. Um, it's been a very interesting study. I know uh, Anthony and Carlos had Dr. Khalil Andani on their discussion recently, and I really appreciated that because we're kind of in between the Jews and the Muslims. You know, somewhere in there, we have the truly, I think, monotheistic faith. And so we need to be dialoguing it with them. And so how can we do that better? And I'll use several things. A key verse to me is John 20, 17. I hammer this in Africa where Jesus says, I send it to my father and your father, to my God and your God. And, and to Cheva, the language of uh, 
Mozambique, Malawi. I send it to Atatiwanga, Atatiwanu. Mungawanga, Mungawanu. In Swahili, it's Baba Yangu, Baba Yenu. Mungawanga, Mungawanu. So who is this Jesus? So let's look at some things here. Um, uh, so some biblical simplicity is, you know, looking at Micah 6, 8. Oh, son of Adam. By the way, I, I, the, the Hebrew is Adam. Oh, son of Adam. What is good? What sin does Yahweh require of you but to do justice, love mercy, and walk humbly with God? I really appreciated that. You know, there's a Latin saying that I've heard before, Audi alternum partum, let the other side be heard. So right now, I don't think in the first century, but right now, we're in a minority position about our Christology. But let the other side be heard. So do justice and love mercy and walk humbly. And I'll, I will surely try to do that today. I don't know everything. I'm studying just like you, just like the Brians of Acts 17, 11. And so it's very important. But realizing some of the promises of Jesus, Yeshua HaMashiach, one will come from you to rule over Israel for me. He will stand and shepherd them in the strength of Yahweh, in the majestic name of Yahweh, his God. And his greatness will extend to the ends of the earth. So Jesus' plan was from the beginning, the seed of the woman, the descendant of Abraham, of the tribe of Judah, the descendancy of Abraham. And Jesus himself says, this is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God, and the one you have sent, John 17. When we're working in uh, Mozambique and Malawi and some Zambia, Matthew 6, 33, seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness is a key verse. And I appreciate uh, the focus on the kingdom emphasis. In Chichewa, it's funi fanano, the fumu wamalungu. Seek first, ufumu, the kingdom wamalungu of God. And so that's where we're going. We live after millennial. Now you can use millennium or millennial, each are plural. We live after millennia of paganization. Egypt, Osiris, Iris, Horus, Babylon, Nimrod, Samaris, Tammuz, Greece, Zeus, Hades, Poseidon, Rome, Jupiter, Juno, Minerva, etc., etc., as Yul Brenner would say in The King and I, even in India and Nordic. So we live in this, we love our gods, our pagan gods, and you know, I don't know if Christianity is any different. Here's a little picture of the Roman Capitoline triad. Jupiter is the king, Juno is the queen, and Minerva the wisdom. Uh, so we're coming out of a long battle with paganism. Paganism, paganism is a belief in multiple gods. And so, but we look at the simplicity of the Bible. And I would look at the end of the sermon of Peter on the day of Pentecost. Therefore, let all the house of Israel know with certainty that God has made this Jesus, whom you crucify, both Lord and Messiah. As you know, Messiah, uh, Lord is an ambiguous term. It can mean the Lord God, especially in the Old Testament. And many times in the New Testament, it says Lord God. But Lord Master would be another term for Jesus. He's our Master and Messiah. Uh, and so if you look at just the numbers, and Carlos mentioned the book, Yahweh is mentioned 6,828 times in the Old Testament. One of every four verses in the Old Testament came to, contains the name of God. We cannot forget that. But God is not forgotten in the New Testament either, either 1,317 times. Jesus, Yesu, is mentioned 917 times. Lord of Kyrios, 607 times. Christ, Messiah, Christos, 529. And the Evangelion, the gospel of the kingdom of God, 154 times. So there, there are basic simplicities there that we need to look at. So despite current orthodoxy, uh, God has made this Jesus, whom you crucified, master and Messiah. I appreciate that. Let's look at a few more things going on. 
So what was the response to Peter's sermon? Repent and be baptized, each one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. And you receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. So we are to respond to Peter and Jesus say they are. Remember in Matthew 16, 16, who do you say I am? And, and Peter says, you are the Messiah, the son of the living God. And that's all throughout the Gospels. Um, and there is salvation in no other name, no one else. And there is no other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. Who gives the name? Who named Jesus at birth? Almighty God named. And of course, Yeshua means Ye Yehovah saves. Yahweh saves. Yes, Yehoshua. And so let's realize that Jesus is the only salvation. We'll talk about the Muslims a little bit later on. But many Muslims believe that Jesus did die and he's in heaven right now with God. So how can we dialogue with them? But the dominant verse of, of the heritage of the general conference is Acts 8, 12. But when they believed Philip as he preached the gospel of the kingdom of God, and the name of Jesus Christ, the Messiah, both men and women were baptized and later received the Holy Spirit. By the way, that's mentioned. Those parentheses are the number of times that those things are mentioned. Spirit is 338 times. And so look just for a minute in the order of things. Um, of course, I didn't count the or and or things like that. I was looking for theological things. God is still the most important thing in the New Testament. For God so loved the world that he gave Jesus, that he sent Jesus. And Jesus then would be the second thing. Uh, you know, he's the plan of God, the logos of God. And again, you can go back to Genesis 3.15, Genesis 12.3, Genesis 49.10, Numbers 24, you know, 2 Samuel 7.16. He said to David, your house and your descendants will be established forever and your kingdom will be forever. So Messiah, spirit, father, love in, in the Old Testament is hesed. But in the New Testament, it's agape. Of course, there are three words for uh, love in Greek, but the dominant one in the New Testament is, is agape. And women and men are mentioned in this verse that we just had. Men and women were baptized. So Pack up the babies and grab the ladies. That's the old Paul Simon song, I think. Uh, kingdom. And the lemma of the kingdom is Vasilia to Theo 154 times and the coming. And not all the lords in the New Testament are, are the Lord God. There are some, the Lord Jesus. And that's why we need to learn to distinguish between the Lord God and the Lord Jesus. I've done a lot, <laughs> a lot of reading. For the last month on this class. Um, one of the beautiful ones I reread was Antony's Who is Jesus? By the way, hundreds of African churches of Abrahamic faith have been generated from that little book that was found by the Sakalas in Blantyre, Malawi. And Anthony and I have been over there together six or seven or eight times, but yeah, he started, and then Jim Madison went over. Of course, Jim Madison is Rebecca's dad, and we went over to help Jim. And then as each of them aged, and somehow or another, we got involved so much more. Rebecca is on the LHI, Lord's Harvest International Committee, and we really deal with that. So you got to appreciate Anthony's work. And I do have a, a short bibliography at the end. If you've got the paper from Carlos and it'll be on the site, you can look at some of those books that I uh, recommended. I highly recommend Kermit Zarley's The Restitution of Jesus Christ. This is like the Summa Theological of Kermit Zarley about Jesus. He answers practically every verse in apologetic style that we would take Jesus not to be subordinate to the Father, but Kermit just lays it out. He died. He was seen. He was tempted. So therefore, he's not God. So check that out a little bit. Another one that I've appreciated and that I mentioned in the paper is done Christology in the making. So I think you have to, to look at that and have to think about, you know, what was it in the first century? What was it in the first century? So uh, think about that. Um, 
And then, of course, um, I know he was interviewed by Focus on the Kingdom, Larry Hurtado. Um, how on earth, this is the title of a book, how on earth did Jesus become a God? Of course, that's very similar to Ehrman and things like that. So you have to look at it and say, what was the first century Christianity like? And so with the quest for the historical Jesus, and Kermit says we're on the third quest. And, and so what did they think in the first century? And, and the story that I love to tell, and I know <laughs> I've told it before, but I was in the uh, SVL, Society of Biblical Literature session on, in Atlanta, and I was in the session on Mark, and the scholars asked Hurtado, did Jesus ever think he was God? And Hurtado said, hell no. <laughs> uh, those are not my words, but true, emphatically true. My mama wouldn't allow me to talk like that. And there are others who are working on this that I've looked at in terms of historical. You know, uh, Kermit mentioned the seven British myth of God incarnate people in their books. Uh, Bakung says, if you're going to talk to Jews and Muslims, the big T and I, Trinity and Incarnation, and so the criterion for being a Christian is not the doctrine of the Trinity. In fact, he suggests in that book that I'm recommending, Dialogue with uh, Other Religions, he suggests that we stop using the creeds and start using the Bible. What a novel idea! <laughs> what a novel idea! Of course, Kung was a Catholic. I don't know if it, in the end he was a good Catholic, but he was friends with one of the main popes. Uh, there was an old German scholar, Rudolf Bultmann, that talked about demythologizing, and I think he went a little overboard. But I have appreciated also Raymond Brown, Jesus, God, and man. And so Brown says of the 1,317 times, maybe three apply to Jesus. Of course, he has others that are dubious. He's got all these texts that don't and others that are dubious, and he boils it down to three that might say, apply the term theos to Jesus. And we would, <laughs> most of us would disagree with this. John 1, no, it says the Logos was God. And John 20, Thomas's exclamation, my Lord, my God. Well, I've had people tell me, my God, Joe, what are you doing? Well, they weren't calling me Joe. It was an exclamation about the event that happened. And I think that's what was happening in Thomas's mind. The other is Hebrews 1. And so that's a discussion from Psalm 45 about the king of Jerusalem. Now, the king on the throne of Yahweh is as Yahweh to the people. And, of course, Jesus mentions this in, in John chapter 10 as well. And, of course, in Exodus 7, 1, Moses is as God to Pharaoh. And by the way, as is not there. Moses is Elohim to Pharaoh. But what does that mean? He's the Shelia, the agent of God. And so we need to start thinking in Jesus in those terms. And many are. And when the myth of God incarnate came out, I think this is back in the 90s or something like that. I can't remember that. But there was a flurry of books back and forth. Kermit says there were several folks. Basically, in terms of the big I, Incarnate. I do believe in a little incarnation. The baby Jesus came on, John 1, 14. The word was made flesh. Jesus, the promised Messiah, who didn't pre-exist really, but maybe in the mind of God, came into existence in John 1, 14. So the, the myth of, car of incarnation, folks, says maybe we should get rid of the big I in our discussion. They even use the term unessential. Look at the paper and see, the, I, I have the page number there. Of course, Dan Gill's the one. Of course, I love Dan. Uh, he says, we're in a fog of philosophies. Yes. And of course, appreciate uh, Joel Hemphill to God be the glory. And his God and Jesus is somewhat based. I sent him a list of 500 times where Jesus and God are distinguished. And his little book, God and Jesus is that book that talks about the distinguishing times in the New Testament where Jesus and God are different. The Greek word chi is very simple, and. Of course, we have others, Candler, Chang, Tuggy, and so on and so forth. 
that we could go on, but because of time, I'll, I'll press on. But we need to biblify Jesus, the Messiah. Remember the purpose statement in John 20, 31? These are written so that you may believe Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and believing you may have life in his name. It didn't say so that you might believe that Jesus is God, but believing that he is Messiah, Son of God. And so in the paper, I listed all the times that my shock was in the Hebrew scripture and then my shiach. So these are two words. You got to know my shock is to pour on oil and then my shiach, that which is anointed. The first indication that, that I saw it talked about was when Jacob was fleeing Esau, he made a bed, had a dream of the stairway to heaven. And that's the old song too. But uh, in the rock that he slept on, he made a pillar and put it on top. And then he poured oil on it. And God refers to it as the anointed pillar, P-I-L-L-A-R. And he refers to it. And it was given the name Bethel, Bethel, Bethel the house of God, the true God. And so anointing goes all the way back to, to God and um, Jacob and so on and so forth. And of course, you really hit it in the in the temple and tabernacle. And we'll get to that. That is totally outlined in the uh, in the paper itself. Every article in the temple was shocked. Every article in the temple was was shocked. The curtains were shocked. The, the labor was Mashiach, and so they became Mashiach. And Mashiach basically means holy to the Lord, set apart for the Lord. When, when the high priest put on the banner, it said, Kodesh Yahweh. In Israel, we bought a book, and they had a beautiful picture of that. Kodesh Yahweh, holy to the Lord. So the Mashiach one, Aaron and the high priest then, were set apart and anointed. So to anoint Mashiach. Mashiach to to be the, that anointed thing. And of course, you had the golden age of Saul, David and Solomon. And so they those are the Lord's anointed. Whether you say Jehovah, Yahweh, no problem. The Lord's God Almighty's anointed. So and of course, especially with David. As he was dealing with Saul, he would not touch the Lord's anointed. In fact, he got on to the guards of Saul who was sleeping in the cave and says, why didn't you guard the Lord's anointed? You could be required to be killed. Uh, let me just go over a little bit. Eventually, though, the Mashiach and the Mashiach came to mean eventually that perfect descendant of David. Psalm 110.1. The Lord God, Yah Yahweh, Jehovah, said to my Lord, Adonai, 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 it's Adonai, it's not the Lord God, Adonai, it's the Lord God, Yeshua, the anointed one. Uh, why do the nations conspire and the people plot in vain against Yahweh and his anointed one? You're the, you are my son, kiss the son. And in that Psalm 2, he says, I will make the nations your inheritance. So what is Jesus' inheritance? The world, the meek shall inherit the earth. Revelation 5, 9, 10. With his blood, he purged the people from every tongue, nation, tribe, and they will reign on the earth. So this Messiah that was to come was the long look for one. We'll talk about um, Micah 5, 2 in just a little bit. Uh, the Messiah is also mentioned in Daniel 9. You know, and we'll talk about that. But anyway, he was to bring rebellion to an end. I think the second Adam did not rebel against God and sin. So he stopped sin. He atoned for iniquity. He shed his blood. He brought in. Now, as Carlos and uh, Tracy have noted, we're not in the kingdom now, but we can taste the powers of the kingdom age now. But the kingdom eventually will come at the coming of Jesus. But we brought in the kingdom message especially. And it sealed up the vision of the seed of the woman, the descendant of Abraham, of the tribe of Judah, you know, the star of Judah, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the one who would march in Zechariah 9, 9 on a donkey in Jerusalem. 
He sealed all those prophecies up to be anointed, and he anointed the most holy place. And Hebrews says, once and for all. Isn't that beautiful? This is your true, true Jesus. This is the true, true Jesus. I need to look at, um, yeah, okay. And so who is Jesus biblically? Who is Jesus biblically? A man. And, and I get that from the proto-euangelion of Genesis 3.15. I love, as I said before, Genesis 3.8. They heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the cool of the evening breeze. That is cool. That is beautiful. Your father was with Adam and Eve in the beginning and could allow his presence to be close to them. Because of sin, God says, I'm going to back up, you know, curse the ground. But in Revelation 21 and 22, it says, God, I think it's 21, 3 and 4 and 22, 3, God himself will be with us and they shall see his face. And so God dwelt with man. But so God is dealing with human beings here. The seed of the woman is a human being to be born of a woman. Who is a human being is a human, a son is a human being, a unique human being. By the way, the term is only begotten, only birth, and that's only used of Jesus. He is a unique son of God. John 8 40 says, You seek to kill me, a man who told you the truth. So, by the way, I'm gonna list 25 people and groups that said Jesus was a man later on. But anyway, the big ones are John 8 40. This is Jesus. 1 Timothy 2, 5, for there's one God and one meter between God and man, the man, Christ Jesus. Revelation 22, 16. I, Jesus, am the root and descendant of David, the bright morning star. Of course, to be a descendant of David is to be the human Messiah. Jesus is called man 150 times in the New Testament. 25 groups or individuals called Jesus a man. And so when the creeds say, fully man and fully God. They got the first half right. The second half is what they're getting wrong. Jesus is the true Messiah, the true King of Israel, the true King of the world, the true Son of God. Hallelujah. Praise God. Amen. I get excited over this. I guess you see that. So uh, I'm not going to do this fully, but here's, here's a little quickie. The 25 who called Jesus a man. The disciples, Jews, the crowds, the Nazareth folks, Pharisees, Peter, Pilate's wife, Pilate, the centurion, Herod, the crowd at the crucifixion, the thief on the cross, John the Baptist, the Samaritan woman, the people of Jerusalem, the guards, the blind man, the blind men, Jesus, the chief priest, the high priest, Stephen, Paul, Felix, James, John. They all referred to Jesus as the man, just like Paul did in 1 Timothy 2.5. There's one God. And one mediator between God, man, the man, Christ Jesus. In all of my crazy education, one of the coolest quotes I heard was from Lewis Smeets. He was a professor in the ethics class at Fuller about 1985. So we're talking about human beings have to make decisions. Did Jesus have to make a decision? Yeah. He could have called 10,000 angels as the true Messiah, son of God, but he didn't. Here's what Smeed said. It would be nothing to hang in there on a Friday afternoon if you knew for sure you would be top dog in the universe come Sunday morning. <laughs> he was a great teacher, by the way. He had several great books on Christians need to be loving other people. And so I really appreciate that. But he sweat as it were, Jesus sweat as it were, drops of blood in the Garden of Gethsemane. And so he was tempted in every way like we are, yeah, without saying. If he's half God, you know, some double union with a God brain, that is not like me. He is a human being. He was tempted as we are, yet without sin. Another uh, one, the most important usage of the term son of man was by Jesus for himself. C.H. Dodd in the founder of Christianity, page 111, said Jesus used the term son of man out of a certain sensitiveness 
in speaking about himself to avoid the appearance of egotism. Rather than say, when I get back, you know, when the Son of Man comes in his glory, you know, so Jesus uses that. And, and I like Dodd's notion, you know, because it fits Amos 6, 8. Do justice, love mercy, walk humbly with God. I think Adam grasped at equality with God. You will be as gods, knowing good and evil. Jesus did not grasp at equality with God. He humbled himself as a servant. Mark 10, 1045. The Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. Hallelujah. Praise God. Amen. Another game I played uh, with my Bible works was how many times does of God show up in the New Testament? <laughs> Guess what? <laughs> 529 times. And so I came up with about 25 of God's related to Jesus. By the way, son of God occurs 40 times in the New Testament. So I'm, this is just the, the individual counting in alphabetical order. Okay. So what does Joe Pesci say in that movie? Okay, 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 okay. I'm not going crazy here, but listen up. This is a long sentence. Jesus is the beloved of God, the bread of God, the character of God, the Christ of God, the form of God, the fullness of God, the gift of God, the glory of God, the grace of God, the Holy One of God, the image of God, the Lamb of God, the life of God, in the likeness of God, Messiah of God, the mystery of God, the power of God, the Prince of God, the prophet of God, at the right hand of God, salvation of God, the Savior of God, the servant evident of God, the Son of God, the truth of God, the way of God, the wisdom of God, and the word of God. What is he not? He didn't say he was God. He said the Father is greater. He also said the Father and I are one, but it's in the context of being unified as we should be. Look at that. Look at the force. <laughs> Look at the force of the New Testament. Jesus is of God. 34 times in the Gospel of John, Jesus is sent. The sent one is less than the sender, Jesus said in John, I think it's 10. Uh, I have to look it up. But look at the power of this, the, the beloved of God, the bread of God, the manna come down, just like in the Old Testament, the manna from heaven. He's the exact character. You know what the Greek word for character is? Character. He's the character of God. You've seen me. You've seen the Father. You want to know what God's like? I am being and doing what God's like. John 12, 49. I love it. The words that I speak are not my own, but him who sent me. The words that I speak are, <laughs> I think NIV says, the Father told me what to say and how to say it. I think that's the 12, 49 verse. So he's the Messiah of God. Yes, he has a, he has the, divine nature but first peter says we can partake of the divine nature too that doesn't make him god because he has a divine nature noah found grace in the eyes of the lord enoch walked with god so in a sense they had divine natures but they weren't god he's the holy one of god he is the image of god the greek there is icon the lamb of god remember what john the baptist said behold the lamb of god the life of God, life of God, the likeness of God, the Messiah of God, the mystery of God, the power of God, the prince. I love this word prince because he's not in his official capacity on earth yet. He is a prince in waiting, just like we're watching all the news about England and stuff like. Jesus is Messiah the prince. Go back to John 9. It talks about when the Messiah the prince comes, eventually the prince is going to become the king. Hallelujah. You know, as Melchizedek, prophet, priest, and king, he's a prophet. Who else can say the right hand of God? I want to make a point here. This is a big point to me. Dunn, Hurtado, even Ehrman says, look at the highly exalted Jesus. Well, yes, Jesus is highly exalted, but he's not exalted to being the God status. He's exalted to the right hand of God. I counted 24 times. You do your own counting. But 24 or over 20 times, 
Jesus is pictured at the right hand of God. This is a simple way of talking. A kindergarten kid where would answer, where is Jesus now? He's at the right hand of Almighty God. Hallelujah. He's the Son of God, the truth of God, the way of God, the wisdom of God, and the word of God. He is of God. So we are not any in any way de-elevating Jesus. We are putting Jesus in his rightful place. Hallelujah. If you want to know in my counting of the 500 times of God, uh, the big ones are kingdom of God, 63 times. Hallelujah. First focus on the kingdom. Anthony, there you go. Word of God, the son of God, the will of God, the grace of God, children, love, spirit, sight of God, glory, wrath, power of God, church of God, right hand of God. In those specific words, right hand of God, only nine times, but reference to over 20 times. Look at that. Kingdom of God, 63 times. This is the forceful message of our Messiah. Come inherit the kingdom of God. Funa fanani ofumu wamalungu. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added unto you. This is extremely forceful. Hallelujah. Praise God. Amen. Um, so what are the New Testament basics? Uh, you can read the paper from, I, I list all these things, you know. I even listed the I am sayings, and I'm going to point that. But the bottom line, God raised Jesus 24 times. This Jesus whom you crucified, God has made master and Messiah. So you don't cruise him with the Lord God. Lord Jesus, the Lord Messiah and Messiah. Master and Messiah. Who raised Jesus? God raised Jesus. Okay. How many times does God the Son appear in the New Testament? None. Um, I have a book. I'll show it to you just a minute. It's a, it's a Holman Sunday school book. I, I took several pictures, but in this book, several times it says, and I, you don't need to do anything, just uh, key doctrine. Yeah, okay. Thank you, Carlos. Key doctrine, God the Son. Is that in the Bible? And by the way, all these tabs, or the times that it says, key doctrine, God the Son. I don't want to de-elevate Jesus. I am elevating Jesus to his rightful place. So we can't go around saying God the Son. And this is one of my encouragements to talking to Jews and Muslims. Don't say God the Son. It's not in the Bible. Why would you want to use it? Greg Dimmitt tells this story about, this is in the 80s when he was taking a class from Ray Brown, Ray Anderson, I'm sorry, Ray Anderson, he said he discussed this with Ray and how God the Son is never there, but the Son of God is over 40 times. And then about that time, Colin Brown came out with his ex auditu article saying that to be called the Son is not to be God. And so with, with Greg's discussion with a very wonderful evangelical professor, Ray Anderson, Greg says, Ray, stop using God the Son and always refer to Jesus as Son of God. I think that's cool. Thank you, Greg. Uh, for I had to call him to remind me of that story. But in Christ, the Messiah occurs 529 times. In the CSB, 400 times the normal Christ, but 116 times Messiah. And so it's critical to take on the more Jewish flavor if you're going to talk to Jews or even Muslims. He is Isa al Masi. Okay. And of course, uh, I looked up. Here I go again on my crazy routine. <laughs> I looked up all the I am sayings. By the way, uh, I am occurs quite a bit. And I don't know the parsing of verbs very well, but you can search for the lima. The, that term there, lima, is. Um, the generic, and so it occurs in Jesus's talk 75 times. So the people that are using I am, oh, he's saying he's I am, a yay, a share, a yay, the I am almighty God. No, <laughs> no, uh, just as though you're not confused, you know, uh, I listed them. <laughs> 
Oh, Lord, have mercy. Help me. Some of the I am statements of Jesus. Are you? I can't list 75 on one page, but here's a lot. When he approached, I love this story. He approached the leper. And the leper says, if you're willing. And Jesus says, I am willing. And he touched him. Don't you love that? The leper was touched by the Messiah, Yeshua HaMashiach, and heal him. I'm willing, I'm able, I'm gentle and humble in heart. I'm in their midst. I'm sending you. I am the son of God. To, I am to rise again. I am with you always. I am the Christ, the son of the blessed one. The Christ. I am distressed. I'm among you as one who serves. I am sending the promise of my father. I am he. When asked about the Messiah, I am he. The bread of life. He's uh, he, I am the bread of life. I am the bread. I'm the living bread came down. I am from him. I am with you. I am the light of the world. I'm not judging and I don't judge alone. I am he who testifies. I'm going. I'm going. I'm from above. Before Abraham was, was born, I am. Of course, that just tells me all these prophecies about Jesus were understood fully by Jesus, the suffering servant song, Isaiah 42, 49, 50, 52, 53. The suffering servant was his job description was in Eve. His job description was in Abraham. His job description was in David. His job description was in Isaiah. Also, I am the door of the sheep, the door, the good shepherd. I am the son of God. When the Jews tried to say he was God, then he was claiming, he said, Uyas to Theu Ami. To me, this is a coup de grace, the death blow to paganism. Jesus said, I am the son of God. He didn't say, Uyas. He didn't say to Theo or me. No, he said, oh, yeah, son of God, I am. I am glad I'm the resurrection. I'm the life. I am lifted up. I am teacher and Lord. I'm with you a little while longer. I am the way, the truth and the life. I am in the father. I'm the true vine. I'm going to him who sent me. I'm leaving the world no longer in the world. I am he, I am a king, I am thirsty, I am Jesus the Nazarene, I am sending you, I'm the first and the last, I am coming quickly, making all things new, coming quickly and my reward is with me. No statements about I am God the Son. Lord have mercy. I, I'm getting a little crazy here, but do you see that? This, this is the true Jesus. This is who Jesus says he is. He is the Christ, he says. He is the son of the blessed one. He honored even the Jews not using the name of God. I'm the Christ, the son of the blessed one. I'm the Messiah. I am the son. And I'm, I'm the king. I love those discussions with Pilate. You know, are you a king? It is as you say. For this reason, I was born. Okay, we're, we're getting close on time, so let's keep going. So my, dis, my thought with reviewing king was, how can we approach Jews and Islam in a better way? And all people, uh, I have a little booklet here that talks about uh, how to approach. Uh, let me show it's It's a little book it calls Islam and Christianity. Thank you, Carlos. And it just says how to approach. So some of the don'ts is you, you do make it clear you're a follower of Christ and do be gender sensitive, you know, uh, and don't put down Muhammad, no matter what you think. And so how can, okay, let's go back to the slides, but how can we approach in, in Islam, Mas Jesus is, Isa is Messiah, born of a virgin, performed miracles, raised to heaven, a prophet. Dr. Khalil Andani, which whom Anthony and uh, Carlos interviewed, is of a group that do not, that do believe that Jesus died. And he cites these two Quranic verses. 355 and 517. Note the Hanif in the Arabia before Muhammad were Abrahamic one God believers and some accepted Jesus. They've been doing a lot of archaeology in the in the northern Arabian in the years two, three hundred. There were stones that were worked with a cross in them. And so some of these Hanif before Muhammad were one God believers who accepted Jesus even. Uh, and how are you? So talk like the Muslims and Isa al Masih. He is the true Messiah. Is it the end? So we have some common ground there. And how are you going to talk to Jews? We have high hopes for biblical Christian Unitarians, biblical 
Christian Unitarians to dialogue. And I'm comparing Bill Slagle, like in his YouTube interview with David and Esther Telsur. And of course, and, and um, the Shema, the creed of Jesus. And there's my, here's my little sign up there. You know, Make the great commandment great again. I love that. I think Carlos did that and took off. I have one on my truck too, by the way, y'all. Make the great commandment great again. Mark 12, 29. Uh, by the way, I believe the 144,000, Tracy was talking about this, are Jews, 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 not JWs or anybody else. They are Jews that are going to come to know the true Messiah. And maybe by dropping the big T and the big I, we might go a long way with dealing with Muslims and uh, Jews. So here are a few suggestions in the matter of uh, five or ten minutes. I'm still looking at the clock. Let the main thing be the main thing. Messiah. Son of God. Yes, he's the prophet, the priest, the king, the savior. All those 27 things of God. Jesus is all those things. But the main thing is he's the Messiah. Hallelujah. Praise God. Amen. Now, in, in terms of prophet, you got to go back to Deuteronomy 18, 18, 19. Listen to this. If we don't listen, to, I will raise up a prophet like unto you, Moses, and I'll put the, my words in his mouth. And if they don't listen to him, God says, Jehovah Yahweh El Shaddai, God Almighty says, if you don't listen to him, I myself will call you to account. I think that's verse 19. So we need to listen to the words of Jesus. The Father is greater than I. The Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve. He washed their feet. This is the example you have. And these are the priests. It is finished once for all. The sacrifice for all time. He is the king. Of course, Messiah means king. Messiah sitting on the throne of Yahweh. He is the king. Yeshua HaMashiach, Isa al Masih. He is the Savior. God as our Savior sent our Savior. They basically have equal uses in the New Testament. God can be referred to the Messiah as well as Jesus. I'm sorry, as the Savior as Jesus is. Uh, Joel Hempel's illustration at a conference one time was, if you had a helicopter and you owned the helicopter and you were flew, flying over a river and saw someone drowning, but you couldn't go down, but you went and got somebody who could go down and save that person in the vehicle. Would you be the savior or would the helicopter owner and pilot be? Yes. Both the rescuer and the one who has a helicopter rescues are the same. So both God and Jesus are savior and those 27 things of God. And so how about eliminate unbiblical words? Don't go beyond what is written. <laughs> don't, don't. Or God will rebuke you and prove you're a liar. Don't add to it. Don't take away. Of course, that's specifically for Revelation. But it's a good reference for total scripture. Stop saying God the Son. It's just not there. Stop saying Godhead. There is no theos kephali in the New Testament. Rebecca comes home and talks about the hydrocephalic baby, the water head, you know. Kephali is head, Theos is God. There's no Theos Kephali. There are words for divinity three times. And we partake of that divinity, First Peter says. But Godhead is not in the Bible. You get people to thinking there are three heads, like the three head that uh, Dale and I have used in presentation before. And stop talking about going to heaven. Practice thy kingdom come. Thy will be done. As Tracy said, why would we be going to heaven when Jesus is coming down here and they will reign on the earth? Uh, how about focus on God's message, Jesus' message, the kingdom message? It's a practical message. Revelation 2, 7 says that's part of your Nikeo. Your overcoming is to have paradise in the garden, in the future on earth. Practical message of all the patriarchs. Practical message of Jesus and his apostles, he sent out the 12. And the 70, he sent out the 70. And what did he do? Told us to go to. This gospel of the kingdom will be preached to all the nations. 
and then the end will come. So we need to keep dialoguing with others, Jews, Muslims, all seekers. By the way, I agree with Sean Finnegan. The way is opening up. People are coming to understand. And Barna, George Barna, who does statistical, statistical stuff, says the new generation prefers the term son of God to God the son, the creedal statement. I like that. There's a shift in the way people are going. People are coming to the one God. Um, somewhere in here, I have the Vaya the team face thing. So, oh yeah, yeah, okay. So as as Anthony and Carlos said, make the Shema great again. Exodus 34, 67. God is compassionate, gracious, slow to anger, abounding love, abounding truth, maintaining love, forgiving wickedness and rebellious sin, yet does not leave the guilty and punished. Jesus practiced that. Come to know the true Messiah. 199 times the Hebrew says, Ani Yahweh, I am Yahweh. And then 77 times the Hebrew says, Vayadatim ki ani Yahweh. They shall know that I am Yehovah. The Chichewa, by the way, is a great translation. It says Y-E-H-O-V-A, Yehovah, which is very close, according to Nehemia Garden, to Nehemia Garden, since that's translated Yehovah. So they shall know that I am Yahweh, Yehovah. They will know, and that's the creed of Jesus. Shema is very simple. If you notice right here, it's my, and I think I have it in the slide too. Shema Yisrael, Yahweh Eloheinu, Yahweh Ha. Over 500 times, God and Jesus are differentiated. Let's don't make Jesus another pagan God. As they say in the South, Lord have mercy. Okay, we're closing on it. There's my beautiful carving. I paid about 25 or 30 bucks to get a uh, blessing. There's a guy in the curio shop in Blantyre, Malawi, who did that for me. That's where I got the Fumu, uh, Funafanani Afumu Wa Malungu too. So depaganize, elevate the real Jesus, the uncomplicated, sincere, simple Jesus. He is the Messiah. He's at the right hand of God. He's the coming one. There are Jesus' attributes by Jesus in Revelation 2 and 3. He's among us. He died. God did not. He has the double-edged sword, son of God, spirit control, key of David, ruler of God's creation, and the rewarder. Let's don't make Jesus like old man George Washington. We got him on the rotunda as a God, apotheosis of Washington. Yuck. So this is a positive presentation. Use the as close as you can to the biblical Jesus, the biblical sayings. I said, I am the son of God. Incomprehensibility, complexity, and remoteness from life in the Bible are today the themes of a crisis of belief, says Kusho. We can bring people comprehensibility, simpleness, Closeness to life in the Bible. There is no Godhead. There is a divine nature, 2 Peter 1, 4, but we can have it too. <laughs> in the paper, I told my big first sin about eight years old. I stole a dollar from my mama's purse. I'm a sinner. Thank God for grace. So that's why I love to tell the story of Jesus. Thank God for grace and making Jesus both the Lord and and Christ. Come Lord Jesus. Okay, Carlos, that's it in the matter of Thank you. Seven, you. seven minutes left. Thank you, uh, Joe, and um, let's see, we have a couple of questions for you, if you don't mind, before you leave yeah. us. Uh, let's see, this is from Kingdom of God Ministry and Missions. Oh, wait, before I I give you that one. So let me share um, your book. You can uh, purchase. Ah, thank you. Your Carl. book, uh, simply God Yahweh, six thousand eight hundred and twenty twenty-eight in uh, on thank, thank on you, Amazon. Carl. So the question is related to your book. Uh, love your your enthusiasm <laughs> and passion for truth. Another one of 
my favorite people. When will Simply Jesus be coming out? Yeah, you and uh, Joe Myers from the Lakeshore Church are really pushed. Lord willing, in a year. So we shall see. I'm, I'm, I am working on it. Thank you for asking that. All right. And um, let's see. Many teach, uh, question here. Many teach we are ruling now. The kingdom of God is here. How would that message be accepted in places like Africa? Oh, not well. Um, the Muslims are forcing down on Mozambique. Some of our churches are being influenced. You go to Nairobi. We were very close to the American embassy with Keith Rogers when they stormed a uh, shopping center close by. We are not in the kingdom. We are in the present evil age. Now we do can't, we are overcomers in this age. Greater is he who is in you than he who is in the world. And yet the kingdom of God is not now. Uh, so I don't think it, they understand, by the way, they understand kingdoms in Africa. They were ruled under tribal authorities. The great chief, the great king Chewa was over here and the great king Tutu was over here. And so they know kingdoms. That's why I think the kingdom message is better accepted in Africa than in sometimes here. We think, oh, kingdom, oh, you must be a Jehovah's Witness. No, kingdom is God's terminology. Hallelujah. Oh, Carlos, did you notice my Shema here? Yep. Great. <laughs> All right, a couple of more here. So you mentioned uh, Dr. Dunn, the late Dr. James yeah. Dunn, who died recently, uh, earlier this year, I believe. Yeah, James. Um, can you uh, address this? Uh, in his book, uh, Unity and Diversity, he writes that the Hebrew of Psalm 1101 uses two different words, Yahweh and Adonai. And that's from his 1990. Yeah. You know, I don't. The, I have his book right here, but I don't want to reach you. But that is a. Uh, yeah, can you tell us how to distinguish between Adonai and Adonai? Well, if you go to the Hebrew, if you could pull up the Hebrew, the first one is not Adonai; it's Yahweh, Yehovah. So it's very clear in the Hebrew. It's Yahweh says to Adonai. Anthony's pointed out that that occurs like what is it, a hundred and so many times? Yeah, look at that. A Psalm of David, Yahweh le Adonai. Yahweh said to my Lord. So you have Yahweh. There's the first one. Thank you, Carlos. That's perfect. Yahweh is the first one, and the Adonai is the second one. So Dunn is uh, didn't want to use the name of God, I guess, for some reason. But it, oh yeah, yeah, he he does use Yah. Dunn is right on there, and you can either say Adonai or Ad, A D O N E E. Both are the E sound, the long E sound. That's a good point. There's, you know, some of those guys are trying to split the Shema and incorporate Jesus into 1 Corinthians 8, 6. And we say in the South, B-O-L-O-G-N-A, to us there but one God and then Jesus. Can you tell us how this thing is? All right. <clears throat> oh, sorry. It's the same one. Uh, one yeah. more, uh, Dr. Joe Martin, if you don't mind. Uh, you mentioned God raising Jesus from the dead, obviously. Uh, yeah. so some people, though, use a passage in John 2 to uh, try and uh, show that yeah, yeah. Uh, Jesus raised himself. So if you don't mind, uh, so let me I read it. Here. People, yes. uh, you know, Jesus it, said, destroyed this temple, and in three days I will raise it up again. And then the people think he's talking about the literal temple. And then... Uh, John says in verse 21, right. Jesus was speaking about the temple of his body. So how do you account yeah. for that? Uh, I know who destroyed the temple. It was Titus. But it's in God's plan. So God is behind all of this. And God told Jesus in, in several places, Daniel 9 and Isaiah 53, I think it's 910. He was cut off from the land of the living. So Jesus would die. But also it says in the Psalms, the Lord God would not let his holy one see corruption. So I would use that one verse and say, look at the other 24 verses that say God raised him. He gave Jesus the authority and Jesus knew it was going to happen. So he was in a sense going to 
raise it up because he's one with the Father. But Jesus didn't raise himself. God raised him 24 times, I believe, that is said in the New Testament. All right, thank you. And just one comment here from Kingdom of God Ministry again. This should be taught and practiced by all students before getting a degree of any kind at the Bible College. Great work. Too great to keep it to yourself. <laughs> I've invited, uh, I, sent a I sent a letter, an email to Kermit, all my friends here in, in Arizona and my relatives, a bunch of my relatives. I said, check it out. So hopefully some of them are tuning in or at least they can listen to it later. I would. Uh, uh, and so thank you for the opportunity, Carlos. This is, this is, this is a good thing. Um, yes. Uh, just one more, if you don't mind. Yeah. Uh, I'll have to read this. It's one. only noon here. I can go on for two hours. <laughs> uh, let me see if I can put this on the screen for you. Uh, t -t 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 let's see. Um, where are we? Where we really did that one? Why doesn't the kingdom of, of God exist in the now present and not the not yet future? Both didn't Jesus uh, believe leave it with us? I think it, it means. I think a, so a great place. Now? A great place to discuss this is in Hebrews 6. You have the six fundamentals of the Christian faith. Faith in God, repentance from acts that lead to death, laying on of hands, baptism, resurrection of the dead, and eternal judgment. Those, But then the next two verses talk about those who were enlightened, who tasted the goodness of the word, who taste the powers of the coming age now. I think we have kingdom power now. We don't have the kingdom, but we have the kingdom power now. And of course, C.H. Dodd talked about realized eschatology in a sense. But as every good scholar on the kingdom says, the real essence of the kingdom will not come until Jesus, the king, comes back. We can taste the power. We live by the spirit now, but the kingdom itself will come at the parousia, when Jesus returns back. Hallelujah. Amen. Thank you, Dr. Joe, and thanks for your presentation, and we look forward to simply Jesus soon. <laughs> I'll try, Lord willing. God bless. Thank you. All right. So I hope you enjoyed that lively presentation, as always. And um, just regarding the kingdom now and the not yet, if I could share one more scripture here uh first corinthians 4 8 uh let me put it in the context here 4 8 so this is uh paul once again rebuking this church or churches in corinth because he he needed to rebuke these these people a lot he wrote uh, it's probably estimated maybe four letters. We have two letters. Scholars believe there are many, a couple more maybe. But be that as it may, uh, this is scripture. And he says to them in verse, uh, let me start in verse 6. Now these things, brothers and sisters, I have figuratively applied to myself and Apollos on your account, so that in us you may learn not to exceed what is written, that's what the Dr. Joe was talking about, not to go beyond scripture, so that no one of you will become arrogant in behalf of one against the other. For who considers you as superior? What do you have that you did not receive? And if you did, did receive it, why do you boast as if you had not received it? You are already filled. You have already become rich. You have become kings without us. And indeed, I wish that you had become kings so that we also might reign or rule with you. So there's always a warning about this kingdom now mentality of ruling the nations. We are not obviously ruling the nations. That was the promise God gave to his son. And I would ask you to read Psalm 2, a very famous psalm about the messianic age and when the son is given authority to smash the nations like 
uh, clay pots. And obviously the promises to the son are also the promises to the church. So I hope that helps. So let's go back to the to the presentations here. We have next Ken Laprod, and I will present him now. And we're back in the theologicalconference.org website. All right, Ken holds a BA in religions from Southern Methodist University. He has been a Bible student since 1972 in several US, US locations, Spain and Mexico. He has worked as a language arts school teacher specializing in helping kids with behavioral, behavioral issues for 35 years. He's married to Luz del Carmen. They have been blessed to raise three sons while working as teachers and pastors of home churches on both sides of the border in Juarez, Mexico and El Paso, Texas. And Ken will talk to us about the gospel of the kingdom of God. What a great title, Ken. And good, is it morning there? It's um, it's early afternoon already. We're we're about an hour later than uh, Joe in Arizona. We're in right. mountain time here, so we're about okay. one at, one o'clock in the afternoon. All right, welcome, and uh, it's all yours. And uh, afterwards, you you can ask uh, Ken some questions. Take it away. Okay, thank you, Carlos. It's a real privilege to to be here. Uh, I'd like to open with a prayer. So, Heavenly Father. Thank you for your blessing, your kingdom calling, and uh, the privilege to realize that your son, Jesus, made the way clear in a way that we need not be confused. Uh, help us, Father, to have what is a lost or forgotten gospel to many people, to have it revived in our own hearts, and to be uh, useful in living it from the heart and speaking about it to others. Uh, open doors, Father. May your emphasis live and abound in our minds and hearts as we peruse the scriptures. We ask this in the name of your son, Jesus, the anointed one. Amen. <laughs> so as, uh, as I mentioned in the prayer, this gospel of the kingdom of God is kind of a lost gospel or a uh, a forgotten or neglected gospel to too many people. And uh, as I'll mention briefly uh, a little while later, I was a part of great confusion for many years, not understanding the gospel of the kingdom. Although I was an avid Bible student for, oh, 30 years or more without starting to get a handle on the kingdom of God truths. Um, I will uh, emphasize one verse that Joe emphasized toward the end of his presentation. In Matthew 24, 14, it says, this gospel of the kingdom will be preached around the whole world as a testimony to all the nations. And then the end will come. The end here means the end of the age. So this gospel, the kingdom will never be outdated. The end of the age is not yet here. Uh, we're closer to it than we were yesterday or last week, but it's not here yet, the end, the very end of the age. And so this gospel is relevant meanwhile. Something else I'll mention, uh, kind of it's an introductory comment, is that there are really only five books in the New Testament that deal with addressing uh, what we would call new people, people who have not yet heard the message or people who have not yet responded to the message. They've not yet believed in Jesus as the Messiah, or they've not yet believed his gospel of the kingdom of God. And those books basically are Matthew, Mark, and Luke, in which you see the, the expression kingdom of God used quite profusely. Uh, the fourth gospel, the gospel of John, is also a kingdom-focused book, but with different vocabulary. It does mention the kingdom of God, for example, in John 3, where uh, Jesus explains to Nicodemus 
that one must be born from above or born again in order to see the kingdom of God. But um, the, the purpose of the gospel of John is, uh, was, was emphasized in Joe's presentation is that these things are written so that you might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Messiah, the anointed one, or the king, the anointed king, and that believe in the, the son of God, and that believe in you might have life in his name. So it's a kingdom book because it focuses so totally on Jesus's kingship, his messiahship. So uh, with that in mind, I'm going to read a couple of quotes uh, that I found. Uh, they, these are on a handout, by the way, uh, a paper that I've written that uh, I'm sure you can link to. But uh, the first one is from Clement of Rome in about 97 AD or CE. The apostles have preached the gospel to us from the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ from God. Christ, therefore, was sent forth by God and the apostles by Christ. They went forth proclaiming the kingdom of God was at hand. The kingdom of God is still at hand. It's near. It's not yet here, as has been mentioned in previous discussions. We'll, we'll see more about that. Another quote is from uh, Thomas Aquinas in 1274 AD. And um, here's a very logical point perhaps made during a time when kingdom thinking was not prevalent uh, in Christianity. But since Christ said at the very outset of the preaching of the gospel, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. It is most absurd to say that the gospel of Christ is not the gospel of the kingdom. That's Thomas Aquinas in 1274. Um, so, you know, with these things in mind, uh, I'll, I'll talk briefly about my background. I was what is called a dispensationalist, sort of in a classical sense, for, for many years. I was a very gung-ho, adamant dispensationalist. We avoided kingdom talk profusely. We were aware of it, but we said, well, that is just stuff that God is doing, going to do someday for Israel, but it has nothing to do with Christians. So we avoided, we even avoided calling Jesus the king among us. In my old group, my old dispensational group, uh, we would, if we had song lyrics where Jesus was called the king in a traditional hymn that we might sing, we would change the word king to Lord because in our thinking, well, Jesus is not our king. He's our, our Lord, but not our king. And um, I was very confused I realized later that I was very confused by such theology that had so dominated my thinking for a good three decades or more, and in certain senses, more than four decades. But, um, uh, you know, I, I think of it now, I think of how dangerously thought, because what we did, but, you know, the word dispensationalism might not sound like a big deal, just a, uh, a vague theological term, but in our particular religion, we separated Jesus so uh, vastly from his very words that we would say that, well, Jesus's teachings are not really for Christians. Jesus's teachings were for a previous Jewish dispensation uh, before the day of Pentecost. But now since the day of Pentecost has arrived, his teaching, including the gospel, the kingdom of God, really has nothing to do with us. And I, I locked into that and thought that way for decades before I had a wake-up call. When I, I did finally have a wake-up call, I'm, I'm reminded of what it says in Luke 11, 52. It says, Jesus said here, woe to you lawyers, those of you who are supposed to be experts in the Torah, experts in the law of Moses, for you have taken away the key of knowledge for you yourselves did not enter, and you hindered those who were entering. And I think about that. I, I had a lot of remorse, a lot of regret about my previous years of misleading people 
because I think of it, we block the way for people to understand the kingdom of God gospel because we disregarded Jesus's words as irre irrelevant to our times, to our supposed dispensation of time. But, you know, praise God for deliverance. One reason I mention all this, it's, it's not too late if we've been trapped or stuck in wrong thinking. It's not cheating to go back and reevaluate and admit to being wrong and confess it to God and then move on with a new attitude, with a new emphasis, with a new mindset that is honoring to the true God and honoring to Jesus and his words. Uh, Jesus spoke the truth about these things. And I think about, we'll, we'll go to a, a passage of scripture right now. If you have a Bible handy, you can follow along in your Bible, uh, these scriptures. But I'm going to read something from Acts chapter 26 here. Uh, in the context here, you know, Paul had had uh, an extremely uh, important uh, change of heart uh, because of an event experienced on the road to Damascus. And that's related, first of all, in Acts chapter 9. Then he talks about it again when addressing some Jews in Jerusalem in Acts chapter 22. And this here in Acts 26, this is the third and last time that this event on the road to Damascus is related and emphasized. So I'm going to start here in Acts 26, verse 14. When we had all fallen to the ground, I heard a voice speaking to me in Aramaic. Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? You are hurting yourself by kicking against the goads. You know, like a little pointed stick that would be used to goad an animal. I ask you, who are you, Lord? The Lord said, I am Jesus whom you are persecuting, but get up on your feet. I have appeared to you for this purpose, to appoint you a servant and a witness, both of the things which you have seen and of the things which I will reveal to you. That's important. There were other things that Jesus would reveal to Paul. I will rescue you from your own people and from the Gentiles to whom I am sending you to, in verse 18, to open their eyes so that they may turn from darkness to light and from the domain of Satan to God, so that they may receive forgiveness of sins and an inheritance among those who are sanctified by faith in me. So this great emphasis here, I don't, I don't think there's a real light in people's lives until they come to the gospel of the kingdom of God, to turn from darkness unto light, to turn from the domain of Satan to God. These are results of latching on to and believing Jesus's gospel of the kingdom of God. Now, Paul was going to be revealed more information. And one of the things he must have been revealed from Galatians chapter one, we won't turn there, but you can, uh, you know, be thinking about what it says in Galatians chapter one, Paul, because Paul says very clearly there in the opening, the introduction of Galatians, that he did not receive the gospel, the one true gospel from fellow human beings, nor was he taught it, but it came through a revelation of Jesus, the Messiah. And uh, in the context, uh, you know, he pronounces pretty heavy-duty curses on those who would distort or pervert the gospel as the Messiah preached it. The Messiah preached the truth, the one true gospel, which um, we must latch on to. Uh, you know, just talking about how Paul himself, I, I want to emphasize a little bit about not misunderstanding Paul, because uh, honestly speaking, I misunderstood Paul for decades while preaching Paul. <laughs> uh, in our religion, the, it was the writings of Paul that were uh, especially focused on Christianity. 
whereas Jesus's teachings were for a previous dispensation. So we missed the gospel. We missed the gospel of the kingdom of God by our theology, by our erroneous theology. And um, here in, um, uh, I'm just gonna mention a few things in the book of Acts because Acts is a great testimony to the coming kingdom of God. The fifth book of, uh, I mentioned the books that are written uh, that are, you know, among other things, there's preaching to those who are new people who've not yet heard the message or believed. And the fifth one would be the book of Acts. So uh, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and Acts make a good starting place to understanding this topic, to understanding the whole New Testament. But uh, in order not to misunderstand Paul, we might want to remember that in Acts 14, 22, Paul uh, and Barnabas were encouraging the, the believers in a tumultuous situation uh, there in, uh, you know, near Pisidia of Antioch and Iconia and Derby and those cities where Paul had already been stoned uh, after they wanted to worship him as a god. They ended up stoning him. And uh, Paul and Barnabas encouraged the believers saying that it's through many trials that we enter the kingdom of God through many trials that we enter the kingdom of God. Uh, Paul also persuaded people in Ephesus about the kingdom of God in Acts 19, verse 8. In Acts 20, verses 24 and 25, you see that the gospel of the grace of God is totally equated with the preaching of the kingdom of God in verse 25, verses 24 and 25. In my old theology, we separated those. Well, the gospel of the grace of God, that's what we believe now, but the kingdom gospel was outdated for us according to our old wrong thinking. But no, that's not how Paul thought at all. In Acts 28, uh, verses 23 and 31, in verse 23, Paul has invited uh, Jews into uh, the area and uh, in, they're in Rome. And he was talking to them all day about the kingdom of God. And then the very last book of the book of Acts, verse 31, Paul is in Rome receiving people. He, he, even though he's a prisoner at some level, he has a relative amount of freedom to receive guests and to teach and preach the kingdom of God. So Paul was just as much an avid uh, kingdom preacher as anyone else. Uh, by the way, talking about how book the book of Acts is a total kingdom book, it was in Acts 1-3 that you see that Jesus, after he was resurrected, he taught them for 40 days about the kingdom of God. That was the theme. That was the subject. Uh, as, as I think will, will emerge, this is really the theme of the Bible. This makes the whole Bible flow together in ways that are not disjointed. When I was a dispensationalist, I would say that I had a very disjointed view of the Bible. Uh, I didn't understand that there was a theme that united the whole thing. So we divided it into different parts and said that different parts are for different people, which is true at some level, but not the way we emphasized it. Anyway, in Acts 1, 6, the disciples asked, that, well, is it this, at this time that you will restore the kingdom to Israel? Which is a very appropriate question. He had just been talking to them about the kingdom of God. He didn't scold them and say, oh, this is a stupid question. He uh, uh, just told them that, well, it's not for you to know the timing factor of when the Father will you know, perform the things that are in his own power. That's why we, we can't set dates, uh, you know, until now. Jesus himself didn't know the time of the coming uh, of the Son of Man. Um, in Acts 8, 12, this is a, a, a verse that Joe mentioned, but when they believed Philip preaching the good news, the gospel about the kingdom of God, in the name of Jesus, the Messiah, they were being baptized which means being dumped in water, both men and women alike. So all this relevant stuff is in the book of Acts. 
So once again, let's not misunderstand uh, the Apostle Paul. Uh, you know, you're probably familiar with Mark 1.15 that says the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. It's near, it's approaching. Repent, which means to have a real change of mind and heart and believe the gospel. When I think of the word repent, one thing I, I think of it, this is a word that it sounds to some people like an old fashioned religious word that becomes practically meaningless. Uh, people don't know what it means, but the, you know, the, the Greek word metanoia basically means to change your mind, to have a change of heart, you might say, or to have a change of life direction. It might include feeling remorse for your sins, your previous sins, but that's not really the focus. It's not feeling bad or feeling guilty about making mistakes. It's really to decide to change. So Jesus emphasized it with the word repent that John the Baptist has also used previous to Jesus. The word metanoia, repentance, uh, is a, you know, a major theme in the Gospels. Then Paul in Romans 6, I'll just read a couple of verses here. You can turn to Romans 8, which we'll read in just a minute. But in Romans chapter 6, uh, there are a couple of verses here where Paul says in, in verse 11, even so, consider yourselves to be dead to sin, but to alive to God in Christ Jesus. So consider yourselves. This is the first commandment in the book of Romans. And it is, in light of baptism, the context here has to do with baptism, with being identified as you get dunked in water, with Jesus's death and with his burial, and knowing that the old man is, is the old nature, the sinful nature is identified with his death. And then being raised from the dead to be identified, especially in the future with his resurrection. Verse 12 then says, therefore do not let sin reign in your mortal body. Don't give it sway so that you obey its lusts. And do not go on presenting the members of your body to sin as instruments of unrighteousness, doing wrong things, but present yourselves to God as those alive from the dead and your members as instruments of righteousness to God. So this whole thing of first considering ourselves, these are acts of free will choices. God presupposes, as Pastor Dan Gill emphasized, we have free will choice to decide no matter where we've been in our lives, no matter what activities were part of our former makeup, we have the ability to say, hey, I consider myself dead to sin. I don't keep considering myself a worthless sinner. No, I consider myself dead to sin. I'm not in denial about the fact that I have frailties and I might need help. Nevertheless, I do not consider myself a worthless sinner. I consider myself dead to sin and alive to God. I present my members, therefore, by my free will choice to God to do that which is right, that which is honoring to God. I focus my time, my energy that way. God presupposes that we have that ability to use our free will decision making in this way. Now, the next passage I'd like to read uh, together with you, if you'd like to go there, is Romans chapter 8. And in Romans 8, we'll start in verse 12. And I, what I want us to see here in not misunderstanding Paul is how Paul very clearly preached the gospel of the coming kingdom of God without using the same vocabulary. So in verse 12, so then, brothers and sisters, we are debtors not to the flesh, not to our um, appetites or desires that are out of bounds, to live according to the flesh. For if you live according to the flesh, according to sinful tendencies, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. For all who are led by the Spirit of God are children of God. 
For you did not receive a spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you have received a spirit of adoption, of being a son. When we cry, Abba, Father, it is the very spirit, God's spirit, bearing witness with our spirit, our inner being, that we are children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ. We have an inheritance if we're heirs. If in fact we suffer with him so that we may be glorified with him. Verse 18 says, I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory about to reveal in us, about to be revealed in us. For the creation, the whole creation waits with eager longing for the revealing of the children of God. For the creation was subjected to futility, not of its own will, but by the will of the one who subjected it in hope that the creation itself will be set free from its bondage to decay, decay and will obtain the freedom of the glory of the children of God. We know that the whole creation has been groaning in labor pains until now. All creation suffers, it's obvious. And not only the creation, but we ourselves who have the first fruits of the spirit groan inwardly while we wait for the adoption the redemption of our body. So we're not exempt from the suffering, the anguish, the groanings of this present age. Later on in this context, when it talks about prayer, it talks about how our groanings or our sighs are too deep for words that can't be uttered or expressed in words. For in hope, we were saved. Now, hope that is seen is not hope. For who hopes for what is seen? But if we hope for what we do not see, we wait for it with patience. We wait for it with patience. You know, we, we could paraphrase that to say, why would we be waiting for the kingdom of God if it's already fully here? If it's already fully manifest here on the earth, why are we still waiting for it? But we still wait for it because it's not here yet. It's not arrived. Death, the last enemy has not been destroyed. The will of God is not perfectly done on earth as it is in the heavenly realm. That's why we still pray the Lord's Prayer. Uh, may your kingdom come, Father. May your kingdom come. May your will be done here on earth as it is in the heavenly realm. Uh, with that in mind, I'm going to uh, go to something. As far as I can tell, there are three scriptures that. Uh, have to do with the coming Messiah of the future. Uh, you know, uh, Joe just did a wonderful job explaining the word Mashiach and Mashak. Uh, people were anointed with oil, as uh, you know, like the, the priests. Aaron and his sons were anointed with oil in order to consecrate them, in order to uh, designate them for a special function. Then uh, Saul, the king, you know, Israel's first king, the first real king, was the Lord's anointed. Uh, David, when, even when Saul became an enemy, David would not lift a finger against the Lord's anointed to, to do him harm. And then uh, David himself was anointed. They were anointed with oil. Uh, as you know, Jesus, as the anointed one uh, in the New Testament, he was anointed with Holy Spirit, when he got baptized, he was filled with the fullness of God in a special, unique, uh, over-the-top way uh, by which he, he did the things that he did during his ministry. But um, when we talk about this, I want to go uh, to 1 Samuel chapter 2 and look at a possible reference to a future anointed one. 1 Samuel chapter 2. And uh, in the context here, you see that Hannah, uh, who's the mother of Samuel, had been praying in chapter 1. She was in deep anguish because she wanted to have a child. She did not want to be sterile any longer. And she poured out her, her heart to God continuously. She got her answer. She had a son with Samuel. She, later, she had more children. 
But um, she dedicated Samuel to a life of service in the temple. Anyway, here in uh, uh, 1 Samuel 2, I'm going to read from verse 8 to 10. You can read the whole prayer on your own from verse 1. But she seems to get a bit prophetic toward the end of her prayer. Verse 8 says, he raises the poor from the dust. He lifts up the needy from the dunghill to cause them to sit with nobles. Indeed, he causes them to inherit a throne of glory for the fixtures of the earth are of Yahweh or Yehovah. And he sets the habits of the world on them. He keeps the feet of his saints and the wicked are silent in darkness for man does not become mighty by power. <laughs> uh, Yahweh, verse 10 here, Yahweh. Ye, uh, Yehovah, his adversaries are broken down. He thunders against them in the heavens. Yahweh judges the ends of the earth, and he gives strength to his king and exalts the horn of his anointed. Now, here at the end of verse 10, it correlates Yahweh's king with his anointed. And it perhaps is at a time of future judgment of adversaries who are being smashed. His adversaries are broken down. They're smashed up, according to another translation. Kind of like in Psalm 2, which is the next verse we'll see. Let's, let's go to Psalm 2 while we're thinking about these prophetic reminders. Psalm 2 is the, the master Old Testament scripture using the word anointed. Uh, now, as has, has already been mentioned, there are many other uh, references to uh, the Messiah. For example, in uh, Isaiah chapter 11, where there's a root of Jesse that's going to sprout. Uh, and you, you see this kingly figure who walks by the Spirit of God. He doesn't go by his own senses, by his own reasoning, by his own eyes and ears, but he does things by the Spirit of God. Isaiah 11, in a future time when the animal kingdom will be uh, restored in a, a powerful way. But um, here in, um, okay, uh, Psalm 2 then, uh, I'm going to, it's kind of cool. You see the context here that, you know, God literally laughs at those who would oppose him in the times of the end, in the times uh, when he will judge the world. Why have nations crowded together and peoples murmur about something empty? Earth's kings take a stand. Leaders make plans together against Yahweh and against his anointed. There you have the word anointed. We'll break off their means of discipline, throw off their ropes from us. The one who sits in the heavens makes fun. The Lord, Yahweh, meaning, you know, the, uh, the Lord, it's actually Adonai there. He, uh, you know, ridicules them. Then he speaks to them in his anger, terrifies them with his rage. But, and, and here is, you know, Yahweh speaking. But I myself installed my king on Zion, my sacred mountain. So here the anointed one is the king, just like in 2 Samuel uh Chapter 2, verse 10. I shall recount Yahweh's decree, he said to me. You are my son. Today I have fathered you. You are my son. So three key factors here. The anointed one is the king installed on Zion, and he is the son who was fathered by God on a certain day, which he calls today. Ask of me. He says to, to his son, his anointed one, ask of me and I'll make nations your domain. Earth's end your holding. So you're going to have this inheritance of the whole earth, he says to his son. You'll smash them with an iron club, shatter them like an object made by a potter. And that's all we'll read right now from there, but it's a wonderful psalm. And I think this is the basic identity of the coming of Messiah is encapsulated in this psalm. When people thought of, you know, God's future anointed one, 
They mainly thought of this person here in Psalm 2. On that basis, the majority of Jews misunderstood him. They expected immediate power to be displayed in something that would disrupt the Roman Empire of the first century. And they missed the point. Uh, the perceptive Christians who got the point after the resurrection uh, from the dead and uh, you know, knowing then how Jesus would return in glory in the future, they got the point. So um, with that in mind, I'm going to, um, um, okay, I'm going to read something from a page on my document. The, the third one then is Daniel chapter 9. Daniel chapter 9, where the anointed one uh, is mentioned with that vocabulary, the, the messianic vocabulary. And instead of going to Daniel 9 and reading it, I'm going to read a little excerpt, an explanatory excerpt from my uh, paper. The third and last passage in which the prophesied anointed or the Messiah, who is called the prince here, is specifically designated as such in Daniel 9, read from verse 24 to 27. The prophecy here includes the timing factor of 77s, 490 years, and past events involving the first 69 of those weeks or sevens, which would be 483 years. After seven sevens plus 62 sevens, the Messiah would be cut off, according to that passage. So it's after a long time with a certain point of restoring the, uh, Jerusalem itself after its destruction by the ancients of Babylonians. So it was under the restoration project began under Persian rule. If you have the right data, you could figure out that, well, starting over 400 years before the birth of Jesus until 30 AD or so, there's about 483 years. Uh, I don't want to, you know, belabor the details of that, but that is the essence of something you can figure out about the timing of the Messiah from Daniel chapter 9. Um, so then let's, uh, I'm going to read something then in the Gospel of John. Don't misunderstand the Gospel of John because even though the terminology is different than in Matthew, Mark, and Luke, it's totally messianic. And one of the things emphasized in the Gospel of John are Jesus' very own words. And um, I want us to uh, think about this in John chapter 12. You can turn to John chapter 12 if you'd like to. And um, here, John chapter 12. And uh, we'll start in verse 44 of John chapter 12, where, you know, Jesus is speaking up. You might remember that according to Deuteronomy uh, chapter 18, that uh, God was going to send another prophet like unto Moses. And this person's words must be heeded. If anyone would not heed the words of this one who was a prophet like unto Moses, he would be cut off from the people. That's a, he would be severely judged by disregarding the words of the prophet like unto Moses, according to Deuteronomy 18. But in verse 44, but Jesus spoke aloud and said, whoever has faith in me, has faith not in me, but in him who has sent me, speaking of his father, God, who he represented. And whoever sees me, sees him who has sent me. I have come as a light into the world, so that everyone who has faith in me might not remain in darkness. If anyone hears my words and does not keep them, I do not judge him. For I came not that I might judge the cosmos, the world, but that I might save it. Whoever rejects me and does not accept my words has one who judges him. The word that uh, the word that I uttered, 
that word will judge him on the last day. For I did not speak from myself, but rather the Father who has sent me. He has commanded me what I should say and what I should speak. And I know that his command is life in the age, life for the age to come. Thus, whatever things I speak, just as the Father has told me, so I speak. So Jesus is great words here. We're going to go now to uh, the book of Daniel. When Jesus talked about the coming kingdom of God, I really believe he was making a, a direct allusion to the vision of the statue in Daniel chapter 2. And we won't go into this in uh, a lot of depth here as we're running close on time here. But in Daniel... Uh, chapter 2, we have, uh, you know, this vision. And I, I'm going to actually start reading in verse 31 here so that you get the idea of uh, what Jesus was alluding to because the kingdom of God is rooted in an understanding of this passage in Daniel 2. My king, as you were watching, a colossal statue appeared. That statue, tall and dazzling, was standing in front of you, and its appearance was terrifying. The head of the statue was pure gold, representing Nebuchadnezzar himself and the Babylonian Empire. Its, his, uh, its chest and arms were silver, representing a later kingdom of the Medes and the Persians. Its stomach and thighs were bronze, representing the Greeks later on. Uh, you can tell this from other scriptures. Its legs were iron and its feet were partly iron and partly fired clay. As you were watching, a stone broke off without a hand touching it, struck the statue on the feet of iron and clay and crushed them. Then the iron, the fired clay, the bronze, the silver, and the gold were shattered and became like chaff from the summer threshing floors. The wind carried them away and not a trace of them could be found. But the stone that struck the statue became a great mountain and filled the whole earth. This was the dream. Now we will tell the king its interpretation. Your majesty, you are the king of kings. The God of heaven has given you sovereignty, power, strength, and glory. Wherever people live or wild animals or birds of the air, he's handed them over to you and made you rule over them all. You are the head of gold. After you, there will arise another kingdom inferior to yours, and then another, a third kingdom of bronze, which will rule the whole earth. A fourth kingdom will be as strong as iron, for iron crushes and shatters everything. And like iron that smashes, it will crush and smash all the others. You saw the feet and toes. You know, we all have 10 toes, right? Partly of a father, a potter's, fired clay and partly of iron. It will be a divided kingdom, though some of the strength of iron will be in it. You saw the iron mixed with clay and that the toes of the feet were partly iron and partly fired clay. Part of the kingdom will be strong and part will be brittle. You saw the iron mixed with clay. The peoples will mix with one another, but will not hold together. So there's kind of a divided unity, if that makes sense. Just as iron does not mix with fired clay. In the days of those kings, the kings of the toes and feet, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom, God of heaven, kingdom that will never be destroyed. And this kingdom will not be left to another people. It will crush all these kingdoms and bring them to an end. But will itself endure forever. You saw a stone break off from the mountain without a hand touching it, and it crushed the iron, bronze, fired clay, silver, and gold. All this history of human empires wiped out. The great God has told the king what will happen in the future. The dream is true, and its interpretation certain. God will perform this. He will bring about his kingdom at the end of a reign of perhaps 10 who are allied with uh, Antichrist in the future. I, I don't really have time to go into 
depth on those kind of details. I'd like us to go then to uh, Luke chapter one. Now I'm, you know, this is sort of a cursory overview of this subject. I'm leaving a lot of things out. We could talk all day about the promises made to Abraham, the land promises, how Jesus then um, said that the meek will inherit the land, will inherit the earth. Uh, we could talk, uh, you know, about the, um, also about the, um, the promises made to David. You, we could read Second Samuel chapter 7, where uh, David was promised that he would have a descendant whose throne would last forever. So with, with that in mind, with the David promise in mind, which we just briefly mentioned here, but we could study these things in depth to really, you know, cover this subject more thoroughly. But here in uh, Luke chapter 1, in verse 26, we'll, we'll read a few verses here. In the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent by God to a town of Galilee called Nazareth and um, to a virgin engaged to a man named Joseph, a descendant of David. The virgin's name was Mary. Greetings, highly favored one, said the angel as he approached her. The Lord, in, in reference to, to God, is with you. She was considerably disturbed by his words and wondered what this greeting could mean. So the angel said to her, stop being afraid, Mary. You have found favor with God. Take note, you will become pregnant and give birth to a son, and you will name him Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. There's that Psalm 2 vocabulary. The, and the Lord God will give him the throne of his father, David. He would be a descendant of the Messiah. As prophesied, he would be a descendant. Uh, the Messiah will be a descendant of David. As prophesied specifically in 2 Samuel chapter 7. He will rule over the house of Jacob forever. And his kingdom will never end. So this Messiah, this anointed one, would be the king. He would be the son of the Most High. He would be the king of a kingdom that will never end. How can this happen since I'm not having sexual relations with a man? Mary said to the angel, Holy Spirit will come upon you, replied the angel, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Two ways of saying that God's interactive, miraculous power was going to produce something in her. Precisely for this reason, what a great translation, precisely for this reason, the child being brought into existence will be holy. He will be called the son of God. Now, once again, we could. there's so much more that we could get into. We could see how the great majority of kingdom of God passages in Matthew, Mark, and Luke are, have a very definite orientation toward the future. Uh, for example, when Jesus uh, you know, said that, well, the Son of Man will come and sit on his glorious throne, and he's going to judge between the sheep and the goats. And some will be dependent on their behavior and their attitudes. Some will be rewarded. Some will not. They will suffer judgment in the lake of fire. A few present tense things that use the Son, that has been mentioned earlier in discussions, but if Jesus would say something like this, but if I cast out demons by the Spirit of God, then the kingdom of God has come unto you. In what sense? Well, very logically, the king was present. The same king who will be the king of the future, returning as the Son of Man, returning on the clouds of glory, as uh, Jesus mentioned. You know, he even mentioned that to his accusers at the very end. But this king, uh, of the future was present. And so the kingdom of God was being emphasized to them. They needed to respond. They needed to believe that, oh, Jesus wasn't doing these miracles through some sort of satanic trickery, but he was doing it by the power of God. So they would not be misled and not fail to receive his gospel 
of the coming kingdom. So we could see a lot more. I'll just mention that don't ever be tricked by people like I used to be to say that the book of Revelation is not really for Christians. The book of Revelation talks about how we will be kings and priests and we will reign with Jesus on the earth for the thousand years and beyond the thousand years. You can read Revelation 1, 6, 5, 9, and 10, and uh, verse 20, verse um, 6. And uh, keep in mind also that the seventh trumpet of the book of Revelation, which is uh, talked about, we won't read it, but you can read it yourself in chapter 11, verse 15 through 18, this uh, sounding of the seventh trumpet, it's referred to in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 as the last trumpet, as our decisive kingdom hope. And um, you know, I'll just quote one verse to, to finish this off. Revelation 10 verse 7 says that, but that God's mystery would be completed in the days of the voice of the seventh angel, the last trumpet, who was going to blow his trumpet that is what he had announced to his servants, the prophets. So this fulfillment of all things of the kingdom promises will take place in the book of Revelations, which is a wonderful testimony of the last words of Jesus that are recorded uh, in our New Testament. So um, that's, that's all right now. So uh, that's what I wanted to share. <laughs> All right. Thank you, Ken, for that great expose of the uh, the Christian hope, isn't it? That's really uh -huh. the end game, as I call it. Yeah. The uh, summation of all things. <laughs> great, great topic. So let us go to some questions, if you don't mind. Sure, that'd be great. Yeah. And, uh, don't ready. feel like you have to answer everything, by the way. You you can just uh, say next. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, let's start with Kingdom of God Ministry and Missions. Thank you, Brother Ken. I'm always blessed hearing you speak truth from your heart. What are your thoughts on those who say that location does not matter? It's not worth preaching kingdom on earth. I would say that from my own experience of having thought that way, I, I thought I used to think that, well, we'll be gathered together with Jesus, according to 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 13 and following, and we'll be floating up there in the air, but we didn't have a concrete hope of returning to the earth. It's vague, it's nebulous. The idea of floating in the clouds forever uh, or uh, not having a notion that we'll be on earth, it, it so contradicts the scriptures because God promised to Abraham that he would inherit this land. He takes him up to a hill where he can pretty see pretty far in every direction. All this land I'll give you. Later on, he says, all the land between the Euphrates and the Nile, which was much further than he could have looked in any direction. Then it says, the gates of your enemies in Genesis 22. Uh, you will inherit the gates of your enemies because you did not withhold your son Isaac. Uh, then in Romans chapter four, he said he would inherit the world. We as human beings are not designed to, to live as disembodied ghosts and never, never land. We're designed to be earth dwellers. We always were earth dwellers. You cannot separate. It's kind of prerequisite to this whole thing to realize that dead people are dead. Dead people are not floating around somewhere out in the wild blue yonder. Uh, dead people are dead and awaiting, needing to be raised from the dead. Why would Jesus need to come back to raise the dead if people are already having a happy existence elsewhere? It's just not biblical to uh, disengage our hope from being here on planet Earth in the way that's described in the scriptures multiple times. <laughs> Thank you. And um, Emmanuel asks, what is dispensationalism? Okay, dispensationalism 
itself, it's kind of a term that refers to theological movements. There, there's lots of varieties of it nowadays, but theological uh, movements that arose in about 1830 in England among the Plymouth Brethren, among other folks too. John Nelson Darby was a prime dispensationalist. We got our dispensational views partially from uh, a 19th century Bible student named E.W. Bullinger. But it kind of divides the scriptures in ways that parts of it are from for Israelites only. Other parts of it are for the Christian church. Now, to say to divide the scriptures from uh, Mosaic law to not being under the tour of Moses, that makes sense from a covenant point of view because we're of a new covenant and not uh, under the old covenant of the law. This is described in the New Testament. But to divide it into exact uh, time periods and say that, well, the law had not really been fulfilled yet during the gospel. So what Jesus taught in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, it's really for uh, people who were before the Christian era, and it can't be applied to us as Christians. That is, uh, in my opinion nowadays, that's a very dangerous theology that leaves people separating Jesus from his words and and unwittingly being very disobedient to Jesus. Uh, so that's what dispensationally basically is. It's not very old in the history of the last 2,000 years. This type of thinking only started in about 1830, uh, less than 200 years ago in England. But, uh -huh. Thank you. Um, is the first resurrection in Revelation 20 a reference to Christian conversion and baptism? I think that the first resurrection in Revelation 20 is, is quite literally blessed are those who will participate in uh, that first resurrection because the, uh, the power of death, you know, the power of the grave, the second death will not have any power over them and they will reign together with the Messiah for the thousand years. I don't think it's a, a metaphorical uh, reference to something else. I think it is uh, a literal thing that's prefigured in the prophets, like in Isaiah, when it talks about a time when there'll be great longevity of certain people on earth, other people will be immortalized, like the those who are participating in that first resurrection. So uh, I think it's very literal. As far as I can tell. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think it also says in that chapter, uh, without looking at it, that Satan will be bound yeah. and will no longer deceive the nations. Is that right? right? Right. Therefore, the nations will not practice war at that time. They they will not take up implements of war. That's prophesied in Isaiah. They will, you know, beat their swords into plowshares, all that beautiful vocabulary about how people will do productive. Uh, things instead of destroying one another. But what a, what a hope we have. That has not happened yet. That's not even close to having come happened in our modern world. <laughs> uh, let's see. Uh, let's go to... Actually, yeah, so this is a companion piece to the last one. What are some verses that teach the millennium 1,000-year Christian rule is literal and not figurative? Okay, I think um, the teaching of the millennium as a thousand-year Christian rule is specifically in, in Revelation 20. I don't think the thousand years, per se, is mentioned elsewhere. Um, I also think, uh, I don't have a reason to think it is not literal, I know that one day for the Lord is like a thousand years, a thousand years like a day. If you have an extended period of time in which there's longevity for humans while there's a restoration of the earth, after a time of major destruction, 
at the, the time of the great tribulation talked about in Matthew 24, uh, that I think it makes sense that there's going to be an extended time of a thousand years, whether it's exactly literal or approximate, I wouldn't know when to tell you, but I don't think it's a figure from something other than a long period of time. Mm -hmm. All right, thank you. One last one, I think. Uh, could you explain verses like Luke eleven twenty, Colossians 1, 13, that say the kingdom of God has come? So let's have a look at those verses. Okay, Luke sure. Luke 11, 20, if I am casting out demons by the power of God, then the kingdom of of God has arrived among you or has come among yeah. you. Colossians 1 13, for he, the Son, has rescued us from the kingdom of darkness and transferred us into the kingdom of his dear Son. Sure. Okay, the, you know, these present tense realities, I think I kind of explained the Luke eleven fifty two 52 verse. If the king, who is going to be the king in the future, when he reigns on his glorious throne in Matthew 25, if he was there casting out demons by the Spirit of God, then the kingdom of God had arrived at their doorstep, you could say. In other words, they were to respond to the king, and they were to stop believing that he was doing these things by satanic power, and they were to believe in him as the king of the kingdom in order that they could respond correctly. In uh, Colossians 1, I would, I would simply say that, yes, we get latched on to being kingdom bound if we repent. If we, as I said in, in Romans, we consider ourselves dead unto sin, but alive unto God. We start presenting our body parts to do what is right instead of going along with sin. Well, we receive God's Holy Spirit. You know, we get baptized. We receive God's Holy Spirit. We are transferred into God's kingdom, but it's still a kingdom in promise. It's a kingdom that will be fulfilled in its ultimate way when Jesus returns in power, when Jesus returns on the cloud with glory as he quote, Jesus was quoting uh, Daniel 7.13 when he talked about that. Uh, when the kingdom arrives in which, uh, such a way that uh, there'll be no more war taking place on earth. Those things haven't happened yet. So there, there are transitional realities, of course, to respond to the kingdom now, to receive the kingdom message now. Very important, very important present tense realities, but they don't replace the future goal that God reigned perfectly over his creation like he always wanted to, that God sent his son back. God foreordained or foreknew Jesus before the foundation of the world to be his herald of truth and then to reign over his creation in glory. It talks about that in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. It talks about how all things must be put under Messiah's feet until the time of the end. Then um, everything will be put under God so that God will be all in all at the end. But these future events, this future resurrection can't be downplayed to have a true kingdom focus, you know. All right. Thank you, Ken, for that, and I'll let you go. Thank uh -huh. you for your great teaching and your Kingdom of God ministry. And uh, until we meet again, God bless. Okay, thank you, Brother Carlos. Thanks. Thanks. Thank you. Hasta luego. Hasta luego. Dios te... Okay, so sorry, folks, throwing in a, a little bit of Spanish. Ken is very fluent. Well, wait a minute. I cannot say very fluent. He's fluent. <laughs> He's fluent in Spanish. So he does great work in Mexico across the border there, as, as we read in his bio, Juarez. So thank God for your ministry, Ken. Thank you for that uh, well-received uh, kingdom of God message. All right. So let's see what's next. We have a couple of faith stories. 
from literally around the world. Yes, literally. So let us start with um, Daryl. Well, actually, Daryl is in Texas as well, Texas. So anyway, the other side of the country. So we'll do a couple of faith stories and then wrap up the uh, afternoon session. So let, I'll, I'd like to present to you Daryl. And he'll tell us a little bit about himself. He's from Texas. I got into so-called Christianity when uh, I was actually raised in the Jehovah's Witness uh, organization. And I, and I strongly emphasize the word organization. Uh, or raised in the truth, so to speak, um, pretty much until I would say regularly meetings and stuff, even as a, a, an infant, until probably around my late teens, 15, around in there, um, started, uh, you know, with school and everything going on, started missing meetings and stuff like that, but always believed that they were the legitimate truth keepers, you know, so to speak, indoctrinated, I guess you could say. Well, uh, fast forward a few years later, um, moved to Victoria, Texas. I've been here over 22 years now and met with some brothers here, elders in the congregation, way high up people, talked to them. Um, me and my wife were uh, actually attending some meetings and stuff. She was a little um, pushed back from them a little bit. She had dealt with them in Mexico. And their big thing was the dress code, so to speak, which a lot of people don't don't understand that, or they think that you know you like, like for us as Christians and what we believe, you can pretty well dress however you are, and we accept you for you know whatever you're wearing. That's unimportant. It's the faith. Well, she was cast away, so to speak, at the door because she didn't have on the right dress attire and stuff like that, and it, it was just a bad experience. My wife really didn't didn't get off to them very much down there in Mexico. But anyway, here, I, I wanted to really, you know, get right with God. And I really wanted to refocus my enthusiasm for the organization and all that. But um, the more I attended those meetings and stuff, the more I realized there was a lot of, a lot of conflict of doctrination. I mean, even from this right here, facial hair, which is discouraged in the organization. And we all know Jesus as well as the apostles and I'm sure disciples back then. Most of most of these people had beards. Um, not not saying that that's, you, you know, important or unimportant. But that's just one of the little things that started leading me astray from from that organization. Another thing is the more I read. I kept reading the same thing that uh, later I would find out through Anthony Buzzer and you and Restoration Fellowship and 21st century. Uh, uh, restoration with uh, uh, Mr. Dan Gill um, is they didn't emphasize focus of the kingdom and their big thing with uh, Michael the archangel was huge for me because I, I, it, it says there in Hebrews chapter 1 to which of the angels did I ever say you are my begotten son none that includes archangels that the angel is angel it includes every angel no matter what their you know um, category might be as far as the uh, the title that they have, Archangel or, or Messenger or whatever you watch or whatever you'd like to call them. So those things kind of added up. And another huge thing for me was because I really wanted to get into the discipleship program through them, their their ministry and stuff, and, and really excel. But the more I looked at it, the more I was just dumbfounded as to why you basically are like on a time clock. You punch in, you report your hours that you've done, Bible studies and all this stuff that's not scripture. And it just really didn't add up to me. So I took a step back from that. And me and my wife, we've always been kind of on the same page as far as uh, religion goes. And it's incredible. We have an awesome relationship like that. Um, she suggested, too, that, you know, she didn't believe in all those traditions, the man-made traditions and denominations and stuff. I took a step back research for years. I would say two two good years. I, I didn't I didn't attend any church or anything like that. I would just look online and stuff. Unfortunately, I went the other direction. I went to the Sabbath keeping and did that through uh, Hebrew Roots uh, with uh, Arthur Bailey. Really good guy. Unfortunately, the Sabbath keeping and all that. 
I'm trying to juggle between keeping my job and working on a Saturday and, th and then the guilt you feel, you know, you're obligated to provide for your family. How can you possibly do that? Like for me in construction and stuff like that, the time as supervisor, I was working not seven days a week. There's just really no way that you can keep up and do the feast of unleavened bread and all this stuff. I tried my, my best and stuff, but that's when I, I, during that time too, I would say I did that for almost four or five years. Well, during those last two years, I was really looking at other things. And because the scriptures, again, weren't lining up, same thing with Jehovah's Witnesses. There's some doctrines there that I just really didn't agree with. And the more I read Galatians and Hebrews and uh, all these things, First Corinthians, for example, and Ephesians, it, it kind of, you realize that there, there's two covenants they're talking about here. And I think as Christians today, living in today's time, we really need to, to look at that and really analyze that and understand Paul's writing. And I don't think he wants to overcomplicate it for, for us. I think his uh, writings can be a, a little tricky if, if you're uneducated, not putting anybody down. Just you really need to analyze what we're in. We're in the new covenant with Messiah, with Jesus Christ. And the scriptures could not be clear in that aspect. And the more I, I understood that, that we're not under this law. And then I've heard the argument, you know, with Messianics about, well, that's just the uh, Talmudic law that they had back then. You know, all, all the, the doctrines like washing your hands and all this different things. I don't believe that at all. Paul makes it very clear that the law is a curse and that we are no longer under the law. It, it's by grace, grace of uh, Jesus Christ. But anyway, um, fast forward just a little bit more. I, I watched a video with Anthony Buzzard, and he was talking to Jehovah's Witnesses, which really, of course, got my interest. His, the way he handled himself and the way he explained it to them was so professional and very scholarly that I absolutely admired his love for them as well and, and the love that they have for their faith. But he also corrected their misguidingness as far as scriptures like uh, for example the hebrews you know michael is, is not jesus christ he is an archangel that's clear um and his compassion that he showed really brought me to focus of the kingdom and the more i really researched y'all robin todd all, all these different people um that's what i was looking for that's that's i want to be a part of that and, and i am and and have been since uh, wow, 2000, probably 17, um, 2018, I met you. Had the had the pleasure of meeting you, uh, Keegan Chandler, Sir Anthony Buzzard, Barbara. I uh, was baptized there in Arlington on February uh, 2018, and it's been uh, it's been a, an incredible journey. Um, I, I was diagnosed uh, on a downside. This was April of uh, last year. Uh, working all those hours and stuff like that at work. I was uh, area operations superintendent over Texas. We installed nitrogen systems and all these different ready mix plants. I traveled a lot. I might have been home probably four days a month, maybe at times even less. Um, I ended up getting DVT, deep vein thrombosis in my upper upper thigh. Uh, very serious. Uh, I, I, right before I started my vacation, me and my wife wanted to travel and all this stuff. I had to travel to Mexico to see her surgeon. My wife's in the medical profession. And he informed me that I had deep, deep vein thrombosis. So instead of taking a vacation for a week, I was off for a month and a half, two months. Bed rest. And that really brought it, everything into perspective as far as uh, me really taking a little bit better care of myself. Um, studying again, getting getting my faith down. It, it was even more so more important when you're you're faced with something like that. You know that affects not only me, my family, uh, my my job, career, which we ended up parting separate ways. But uh, the job I have now is exactly what I've wanted. Um, it, it's strictly more of a mental. Uh, job. I do do, of course, some physical stuff like that. I'm production supervisor, ADS, in Yoakum, Texas. Um, it, it's a blessing, you know, and everything happens for a reason. And I stress the importance of that. You know, sometimes we get just disgruntled. You know, I, 
was living in hotels, you know, different cities, uh, even in uh, Tennessee, Knoxville, as far as Knoxville, Tennessee, all the way down to McAllen, Texas, we would travel all that distance and stuff. So now I'm home every day, every night. I get to see my family every day. Uh, feel better. Um, for three months, I had that deep brain thrombosis, and through the grace of God, I was fully healed. The doctor told me, by the way, that that's a one, one in a hundred chance. It's basically a miracle. And I, I thanked him, and I'll never forget it because I, I didn't know he was a faithful man. He is. He said, I said, thank you so much. I really appreciate everything you've done. And I said, thank God. He said, yes, thank God, because we are his instruments. He knows we are his vessels. Absolutely correct, too. Um, since then, like I said, I've got, got my job back, good job that I really enjoy, get to spend more time with family, get to read, which I highly recommend, everybody. <laughs> Sorry. It's very good commentary. Sir Anthony does an excellent job, and he always pinpoints, just like you do, Carlos, and the rest of our brethren, Tracy Z, Robin Todd, the importance of the kingdom of God. That is what it's all about in the age to come. So any believer that um, is kind of on the fences, be it denominational Seventh-day Adventist, be it Jehovah's Witness, I've pretty well been there and, and done that. And I, I understand it, it's it's very tough, you know, and you're, you, you're very mixed and on the fences with uh, you, you want to serve God and keep his commandments. And, it, and that does say that many times in scripture. But it's obvious that Jesus did more than just so-called keep the Torah. He didn't really, he didn't really do that. He magnified it from the get-go. And that's clear in scripture, all these things with divorce, the pre divorce. He not only took what Moses had said about divorce, but he magnified it to an even greater spiritual level that uh, you're just not gonna find in the old law. And, and another thing is that they say, well, we have, you know, God never changes. His covenants never change. And, and that's just not true. God's love and his um, attributes never change. That is true. However, we know from scripture, covenant wise, food wise, even that he has always changed things according to his will and what he, what he knows is best for us. And you can go look at Adam. It's obvious. I don't believe he ate, he ate meat or anything like that. I'm sure he ate fruits and vegetables and stuff like that. So then you go to Noah and he gets into the, the meat, able to eat meat. Then you even go a little further to Moses. He gets to partake in just clean meats. And my question for, for everybody is in the age to come, what do you think you'll be eating? You know, because the lion's going to be eating straw with the, the calf. It's it's very so you can't not say that he doesn't change as far as what he thinks is best for us, and that includes the Sabbath. I know the Sabbath is going to be reinstated um, in the age to come, as long as feasts and tabernacles and things like this. Keep in mind that's a totally new age. We're going to be reborn, resurrected with Christ, having qualities and and mindset, intelligentness that we can't even fathom. So uh, I just want to make that clear. My faith is uh, strictly with Restoration Fellowship and, and like-minded Christians and brethren. Throughout. There's a, um, I, I would call it a cloud. It's like you, you feel very um, afraid to do almost any little thing, be it watch uh, Harry Potter or some silly movie like that, because you think it'll go against Jehovah's will. You know, that's witchcraft. If you live a life like that, you're going to be so paranoid. And I, and I, th I think that's a big, big thing. It's that fear paranoia that we have and brothers coming over and sisters and stuff. And you want to make sure the house doesn't have like a poster of Lord of the Rings. I'm just using that for a silly example, but you understand what I'm saying. You have to really, you're kind of walking on eggshells, you know, and, and, and any little thing can get you disfellowship. Um, it, it, it's, it's sad. It's sad. It's, it's a sad organization. Again, I absolutely love my family members in it and I wish them the best. Um, but I'm so grateful that my path led me to, uh, the scattered brethren.
All right, so that was Daryl in Texas. Sorry for the low volume there. Actually, I shouldn't shout in case you had it up. <laughs> so I will slowly start to raise my voice. <laughs> uh, so yeah, that's an amazing, amazing testimony. We we attract, as you can appreciate, many uh, Jehovah's Witnesses, current and former. Uh, we have been told so many current JW. So let's let's keep praying for people in that uh, organization, so-called, that they may, as I as I always say, um, escape the tower <laughs> and uh, and uh, come out and be able to find freedom in Christ. So, and the same goes for the uh, our Sabbatarian friends out there. All right. So next. Up, we have Aaron, and Aaron is international. He's uh, American, and uh, but he's actually in uh, the UK at the moment. So let me present to you Aaron, and he'll tell us more about himself. Well, uh, my name is Aaron Flau. I'm currently living over in england i've been living in england for about five and a half almost six years now originally from washington state um married with uh one one uh about to be eight month old a uh, little boy uh so that's been a really exciting uh past past year or so since since uh my wife got pregnant so it's been been really exciting love being a dad uh came into the faith so a little bit about of my my background is kind of I, I was born into a family that was very far from being a church going family, and both my parents before I was born made the decision that with with me, they were not going to teach me about religion, um, they weren't going to teach me about God, they weren't going to teach me about Jesus. Uh, you know, if I wanted to when I was older, I could go and find it find it on my own. So then I was I was born, uh, and as a little kid, uh, or you know, once I became a toddler and I kind of knew a few words, started being able to piece together sentences. My parents still had not really taught me anything uh, in regards to religion. Had not really. Uh, maybe you know, maybe they told me that you know, people believe in in a god that created the universe, but definitely did not steer me towards Christianity. <clears throat> And things kind of changed one day, though, when I was sitting in sitting in the car with with my mom, probably about maybe three years old, and a commercial was on, and 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 Jesus was mentioned in it. And my mom didn't really think anything of it, but little kid me kind of freaked out. Went, Jesus? Wait, what did they just say? I said, Oh, my mom said they said Jesus. I go, Jesus? I know him. I know Jesus. And then my mom said, oh, well, and she was kind of weirded out because I sh shouldn't have known anything about Jesus. And she said, well, how do you know? How do you know Jesus? I'm like, oh, he's he's my friend. She goes, well, what do you guys do together? I go, well, uh, we we listen to people pray. At first, I didn't really understand. I was kind of confused. Like what? She's like, because didn't really, you know, I hadn't been speaking English for very long at that point being a little toddler. And she's like, well, friends, you know, they, they play together, you know, like play with toys. What do you guys do? And I go, yes, we, we listen to people pray. Like, oh yeah, obviously. Uh, and she's like, well, who do you listen to pray? I'm like, well, we listen to my uncle Jerry pray. Now I don't actually have an uncle Jerry, but I was telling this story and, and I'm like, well, you know, we listen to uncle Jerry pray, like uncle Jerry, he's, I started telling her about how Uncle Jerry was uh, in the hospital and he was praying because he had he had cancer and he was dying. Uh, you know, he was praying, uh, you know, saying that he was so sorry that, you know, he had smoked his whole life and he was afraid because he had cancer. And uh, my mom asked what me and, and Jesus were doing in the hotel or in the hospital room. And I said, we were up on the ceiling. And when she asked what we were doing on the ceiling, I said, we were crying. And that kind of started sort of a trend of for about months on end, I'd tell these 
these things to to my mom. Like I talked to my mom about Jesus. I talked to my mom about this Uncle Jerry, uh, and my uh, it made my mom completely rethink spiritual matters. And then one day I stopped talking about it, and she kind of noticed after a while that I wasn't really talking about these things anymore. So she asked me one day, uh, you know, how's Uncle Jerry? I go, Uncle Jerry, who's that? I don't remember any of it. I don't remember anything about this Uncle Jerry. I don't, you know, I, I didn't really talk about Jesus anymore. And uh, that was kind of that with that sort of period as a toddler going on into my life, you know, as I became more of a, a full-fledged kid. Uh, I don't remember at any point ever not believing in God. I do remember always believing in God. And then when I was maybe about nine or 10, uh, my parents had split by this point. And my dad's girlfriend at the time, uh, her mom came over and she was, you know, your traditional Helen Brimstone Baptist. And she came to me as a little kid and said, oh, are you saved? I'm like, well, what does that mean? What's being saved? And she goes, well, uh, you know, there's a God, and he's our father, and he loves you. I said, yeah, that's great. I believe in God. Yeah, he loves us. And she goes, and he sent his son Jesus to die on the cross for your sins, and he also loves you. I'm like, yeah, but I, I buy it. I believe it. And she goes, but if you mess up and you don't become saved, He's going to send you to hell and you're going to be tortured for all eternity. And being a nine or 10 year old, that freaked me out. I was like, oh my gosh, yes, I, I want to be saved. Please save me. I don't, I don't want to be tortured for all eternity. And I kind of, you know, I got into it. I started reading uh, Genesis. There's a King James version. I'm a little kid. Uh, a lot of it's kind of going over my head a little bit. Uh, and I started to kind of connect some of the dots. And I realized that certain things, in my opinion, didn't really match up, so didn't really add up. I'm like, well, if he's a, if he, he's our God, if he's our Father, and he loves us infinitely, and he's perfect, and I, I, I just, I couldn't reconcile that a loving, our loving God would send us to hell to be tortured for all eternity. You know, if, as it was painted, the picture that was painted to me, if, you know, even if we, we slightly mess up or if we can't figure out what is the truth, if we can't follow him perfectly, and we can't figure out how to follow him perfectly, you're, you know, you're going to hell for all eternity to be tortured. I was thinking, well, I'm a kid, but if I had a child uh, and they disobeyed me, I wouldn't tell them to put their hand on a, on a stove burner forever, or even on a stove burner at all. And I'm still not that way. Now that I'm a dad, I still could not, imagine ever being that way and so from that point on i kind of started getting more into studying the scriptures studying different denominations of christianity trying to kind of figure out well okay how can i reconcile my loving father god with how he's painted in or how i thought he was painted in the bible and i kind of did that for a few years Kind of jumping between all these different, you know, studying different denominations, different sort of uh, philosophical tracks on who and what God is and sort of how he views humanity and uh, our relationship with him, especially through Jesus. And then uh, I think when I was about 15, I went through kind of a rough patch in my life. You know, um, we moved, I was dealing with a bit of depression. And I, there was about a span of uh, one to two weeks where, um, I, you know, I was my rebellious phase and I felt kind of angry with God. And I was like, God, I don't, I don't believe in you anymore. It, I just, I, I can't figure out what, what the truth is. I, I can't see, uh, you know, where, where the proof is that you exist. And I just, I can't figure it out. So I, I became for about a week or two a self-declared atheist. And uh, leading up to that point, I'd always felt sort of God's presence in my life. And during that week or two, when I became a you know, self-declared atheist, uh, it became more prominent than ever. It's like if you're trying to ignore somebody and they're just sitting there poking you, 
is kind of how it felt on a spiritual level. And so I kind of one night in prayer, uh, I was talk I was I was talking to Jesus and I got really angry and I was like, well, you know, where's where's the where's the proof that you you know exist? And I got kind of back a very firm, very stern response of, well, you've already you've already gotten your proof. And that made me think of, oh, all those experiences, all the stories I used to tell as, as a little kid. And I felt really bad. Um, you know, I, I wept, I repented. And from that point on, I knew, okay, for a fact, God is. And Jesus, you know, I believe that he's a son, but at the very least, he's very different or else as a little kid, it wouldn't have been uh, Jesus that was the connecting point. When I said, oh, you know, I know Jesus. So I revisited, again, looking at different denominations, different philosophies, making sure that, you know, Jesus being the son of God and being sort of the an important foundation in the my spiritual search and walk uh, was kind of at the forefront of everything. Then and I kind of sort of for a while set on something, you know, I kind of sort of was a self-declared like Gnostic, like oh, I'm a truth seeker. I uh, believe some things that I definitely don't believe now. I'm kind of embarrassed and, and you know, you know, certain things that I used to believe I'm, you know, a little embarrassed about. Definitely don't believe those things anymore. Um, and I was still struggling reconciling uh, angry angry God that's going to torture people for all eternity with a uh, loving, compassionate, patient uh, Father God. So I had trouble reconciling those. I also started to learn about different, uh, you know, different doctrines like the Trinitarian doctrine. I didn't quite understand it, but from what I, from what I heard about it, sort of trying to attend different churches, it didn't quite make a lot of sense to me. I was like, well, that's, it's not quite how I understand it, but okay. I don't, I'm not a theologian. I don't really, I haven't read the full Bible. At, at that point, I kind of read certain books here and there within the Bible. Uh, and I got, I kind of was getting stressed out and frustrated again. I'm like, oh, there's all these different denominations. There's so many, there's so many, you know, ways of, of thinking about you, Father. Um, and also, you know, all these people are saying that you're this way, but I feel that you're this way. And uh, but I also don't want to mess up and, and end up going to hell to be tortured forever if I if I'm wrong. And so I was praying, I was praying and I was talking to God one day, uh, praying really intensely. Like, uh, you know, there all these people are saying these things about you. The Bible's saying this about you, but I'm I'm having trouble understanding it. Just show me, show me the way, show me the truth. And I got back the response, read the Bible. And I'm like, yeah, well, but the Bible says says this right and and I had, I, i'm having trouble with that and i got back and the response read the bible and again i started kind of trying to argue again like ah but i don't know and then the response was read the bible over and over and over again until you understand and so i got the same response over and over again i'm like well i'm not going to argue with i'm not going to argue with god so at that point i remember thinking oh there must be some kind of knowledge or something I'm going to find in the scriptures by reading it over and over again. Then within about a week or two, uh, went out to eat for my mother's birthday, um, went out with uh, my grandfather, who was very, uh, you know, I knew from talking with my mom that he's very into studying the Bible. Um, I had kind of shied away from conversations with him in the past because I was kind of afraid of that sort of hell and brimstone, uh, you know, you're going to go to hell and be tortured for all eternity. I was afraid of that kind of conversation. I wasn't really looking forward to it, but we ended up sort of through my mom uh, being set up to kind of meet together and talk about, you know, spiritual matters. And so we met not long after that. Again, this is probably just a few weeks after my conversation in prayer with um, our father to read the Bible. And I did start, I had to start on doing that. I started from, from page one of the Bible to start reading through. And I, I uh, in my meeting with my grandpa, I said, well, uh, cause he asked me, what do you believe? I'm like, well, you know, I, I believe in God and I believe Jesus is son. 
but I have trouble, you know, with with what the Bible says about God because I have trouble with this Trinitarian doctrine. It's kind of weird. It doesn't really make sense to me. Also, uh, I have trouble reconciling that God is going to send us to hell for all eternity. I don't, you know, or at least send everybody to hell for all eternity, and you know, people are going to get, you know, tortured, uh, you know, horrendously. And he's like, well, you know, the the Bible doesn't actually one doesn't teach the Trinity. It also doesn't teach that people go to hell for all eternity. It also doesn't teach that when you die, you go to heaven for all eternity. And sort of that's when my skepticism came in, like, what? I feel like if that's not what the Bible taught, we wouldn't hear about that in all the mainstream. It just doesn't make any sense. And so that's when I learned that, well, when we die, we are asleep and we're awaiting a resurrection of the dead into a future kingdom of God that's going to be set up by Jesus when he returns. And uh, he's going to set up a thousand year reign on earth. And then after that, there's going to be another resurrection of the rest of the dead. And then there's going to be a massive judgment. And then heaven and earth are going to become one. And I was skeptical about it at first, but I made the point to be reading through the scriptures, especially because of my conversation that I had with the Lord a few weeks previously. It kind of in, in the back of my head, I was realizing, well, maybe this is what God was talking about when he said to read the scriptures over and over again to understand is because maybe what's being taught in the mainstream and what's actually in the scriptures don't match up. And so I started reading through the scriptures and over the course of about a year, I went through highlighting, uh, you know, I highlighted every passage that I could find that had to do with, well, what, what happens when we die? I highlighted every passage that had to do with who is God, who is Jesus, What's their relationship? What's their relationship in, uh, in regards to us? And what is humanity's ultimate destiny? Why, why are we here? Why do we exist? And at the end of that year, I decided, uh, yeah, when we, when we die, we, we, don't, we don't go to heaven or hell when we die. But we're asleep and we're waiting for Jesus to come back so that we can be resurrected to you know, reign with Jesus over the earth for a thousand years. And that's sort of the story of how I kind of became a Christian uh, and then also how I became more into, you know, understanding what the Bible actually says in regards to our relationship with God and who Jesus is, who God is, and what our ultimate destiny is. Uh, honestly, I think if, if you pursue the Lord with a humble heart and an open mind, you stick to the scriptures. You, um, you know, you lean on your brothers and sisters in Christ. Definitely lean on your brothers and sisters in Christ. We're not we're not doing this alone. And uh, the Lord set, set up the system that is our family, that is the church on purpose. He set it up that way purposefully. You know, we're all in this together. So just keep on seeking the Lord. Uh, do it humbly. Do it with your brothers and sisters. And I think. You know, in the in the end, uh, you'll you'll find what what you know what the right path is, and I think you know the Lord is going to appreciate it as long as you're doing all of these things and seeking Him earnestly. All right, that was Aaron. So I'd like to thank all our faith stories the uh, people who have taken their time to to tell some of their stories their personal stories hope it edifies encourages you out there around the world so that was uh, Aaron he's living right now in the UK but he's obviously an American as you can hear so all right well this is it for the day two afternoon shift <laughs> my afternoon shift so we will be back uh, in a couple of hours, it's nearing 5 p.m. here on the eastern coast. And we will be back with the man himself, Sir Anthony Buzzard. Again, just go to our theologicalconference.org for all the information. And uh, many of you know uh, Sir Anthony, know about him. If not, he also has a Wikipedia page you can look at which is very good actually I, 
I set it up years ago and now it's got more information. So, uh, and the focus on the kingdom.org, which is our, let's call it mother ship, the main uh, website. So Anthony will talk to us tonight about a twisted Paul and a rejected Jesus. So that should be fun. So check that out tonight. Also tonight after Sir Anthony's presentation, I will do the free drawing. So if you'd like to be in it, be in it to win it, right? Isn't that the uh, way it goes? So. This is a drawing for uh, any who wins or is picked in the draw will get a shot at one of the books published by Restoration Fellowship. So just go to focus on the kingdom.org books and you'll be in the running to win. Perhaps if you'd like, you, you just tell me which book you, you want. Again, this is all free, by the way. The uh, latest New Testament with commentary, second edition from Sir Anthony. There's the amazing names and claims of Jesus and many other books, except Keegan's out of print, The God of Jesus book. So th this book, unfortunately, is out of print. Uh, it depends on the author, by the way, in this case, Keegan if they want to go ahead with a another print run or a second edition so it's up to the author which has published the books uh so unfortunately that's out of print uh this one is still in print actually there's a second edition of greg dibel's they never told me this in church so you can be in the running to win that as well so again, Carlos at thehumanjesus.org, if you'd like a shot at, at one of those books. And as you can see, the will is ready. We have 10 people in the running, only 10. So, you know, if you put your name in, uh, by 7 p.m., by the way, by 7 p.m., Eastern Standard Time. So I will close the free drawing uh, by 7 p.m. my time, which is Eastern Standard or New York time. As, is, as you can see, the wheel is ready to be, be fun. I think that's how you say it. <laughs> All right. So, yes. Yeah, so we'll be back 7 p.m. Uh, get your name in. Email me. And so we'll close out uh, this afternoon's session with a prayer, as we we'll usually do, and then we'll be back at 7 p.m. Father, we thank you for this time. Thank you for the speakers, the faith stories, the hard work put into all of that. We thank you for this technology, for the this country living in, in this relative peace and, and comfort, and we're able to freely preach the gospel about the kingdom of God. We ask you to uh, bless Ken and, and bless Tracy and, and Joe and Alexander in Switzerland and all the faith stores once again. Bless those less fortunate than us. In Jesus' name, amen. So we'll be back soon, folks. So tune in at 7 p.m. God bless. And until we meet again.